it's a pleasure for me to welcome all of you today to the University of Chicago Center in Paris. Um, this uh, colloquium has been organized in collaboration with the Appel à Projet, or the, the Call for Projects um, initiative, which we began a few years ago and which allows us to collaborate with local institutions and scholars. We are able to offer a modest amount of funds, but I think maybe more usefully for um, some of our collaborators, we're also able to offer the use of our space, um, the help of our very efficient, very kind staff, uh, and the technical support that the center has. Um, and so it's it's really nice to be able to also do hybrid events to welcome people in person, uh, which is still kind of a new thing or <laughs> that we're able to do again and to have the webinar format. So very, very pleased to uh, have been able to host this conference here today. And I'm gonna turn things over to the conference organizers, Dumna Qureshi and Lori McGuire. Thank you very much. When the American people look back on the Vietnam War, they often make two mistakes. First, they do not give the same consideration to the Korean War, which has not even come to an official end. Secondly, they do not realize that both wars were far more than just an American experience. Our conference, Vietnam and Korea, two battlegrounds of the Cold War, will help correct these mistakes. The American home front during the Korean War deserves just as much attention as that of the subsequent conflict. Official rhetoric presented the Korean War as a fight for freedom, prompting many Americans to question um, oppression and inequality at home. In a sense, the US civil rights movement had roots in the Korean War. Within Korea itself, the Korean War affected the native culture and ordinary life to an extraordinary degree. Korea then laid the groundwork for the moral debates of the Vietnam era. As with the previous American intervention in Asia, the Vietnam War was portrayed as a defense against communist aggression. Actually, the fighting in Vietnam commenced as a struggle against French colonialism before evolving into a more complex Cold War conflict. Far better than its rival to the South, North Vietnam excelled at international diplomacy. Hanoi effectively controlled the diplomatic efforts of the National Liberation Front, the indigenous challenge to the South Vietnamese regime. The common perception, American perception, of Hanoi as a tool of the Soviet Union and China may have been an exaggeration. Nevertheless, this perception did have some foundation in reality. Both Moscow and Beijing helped make Hanoi's ultimate triumph possible. Moreover, North Vietnam even made some Western friends. Sweden, for example, officially condemned the war and even provided humanitarian aid to North Vietnam. Of course, scholarship on the American perspective remains vitally important, particularly during the phase of US disengagement. Memories of the Korean War influenced Presidents Lyndon B. Johnson and Richard M. Nixon in their diplomacy with the North Vietnamese. When Nixon's national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, was engaged in final peace negotiations in early 1973. American domestic politics were in the forefront of his mind. Kissinger's concern about American public opinion differed little from his predecessor's decisions regarding the conduct and termination of the Korean War. Thus, the two wars are connected in fascinating ways. If the United States had not gone to war in 1950, leading to the ultimate creation of South Korea, 320,000 South Korean troops would have not joined the American forces in South Vietnam between 1964 and 1973. At the same time, the Vietnam War contributed to the economic and geopolitical transformation of South Korea. Before our, final pre our first presenter takes the floor, I would like to thank my co-organizer, Professor Lori McGuire of the University of REM. Here at the University of Chicago Center in Paris, I am grateful to Professor Daisy DeLogo, the academic director, and her predecessor, Professor Francois Richard, Sebastian Greppo, the administrative director, and Marie Sahakian, the communications and student services coordinator, have both been extremely helpful. Now I would like to introduce our first speaker. <clears throat> 
Um, Dr. Laurie McGuire completed her doctorate in modern British history at Oxford University and her habilitation or advanced doctorate in British and American history at La Université Paris-Sorbonne. From 2005 to 2020, Dr. McGuire was full professor of British and American studies at the University of Paris 8. She is now full professor of British and American studies at the University of Rennes. Dr. McGuire has published two monographs, both with Paul Grave Macmillan, Anglo-American Policy Towards the Free French and Conservative Women, A History of Women and the Conservative Party, 1874 to the Present. Her book in progress is Becoming North Vietnam, the development of the North Vietnamese state as seen through the eyes of the French, UK, and American consulates in Hanoi, 1954 to 1960. She has contributed articles to peer-reviewed journals such as Cold War History and the Journal of Popular Culture. Now, Dr. McGuire will present her paper, The UK and the North Vietnamese Trade Delegation in Hong Kong During the Vietnam War. Dr. McGuire, the floor is yours. Thanks everyone for coming today. Um, I know it's probably not the sexiest subject in the world, uh, the North Vietnamese trade delegation in Hong Kong, uh, but I think it's really interesting uh, myself. And this is a very preliminary work, uh, I'd just like to say. So any kind of uh, criticism advice is, is very welcome. Um, now, uh, Lubna was talking about the international dimension of uh, the Vietnam uh, conflict. And a number of studies, of course, have appeared on the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, the DRV or North Vietnam, uh, as an actor in its own right. Um, however, there are very few studies on the DRV's relations with its uh, neighbors uh, in Asia, except, for, of course, for the uh, enormously important relationship with China. Uh, this paper seeks to fill some of this gap by examining Hanoi's relations with uh, one of its smallest and most unique neighbors, the British colony of Hong Kong. Inevitably, it's also a reflection on um, British relations with um, uh, North Vietnam and uh, British uh, relationship with uh, the Vietnam War in general, which I mean, um, some studies, there have been a number of studies done of it, but no one has ever looked at really uh, the role of Hong Kong. Um, and it provides one of the earliest examples of the DRV's interactions with a non-communist and economically uh, important um, country, area in the region. Um, and um, th what I would like to do is answer in this paper a number of pertinent questions. One is, why did North Vietnam want an economic link with a capitalist economy in the first place? And a colony, uh, and a capitalist economy that was in turn the, co the colony of one of the closest allies of the United States, and one which played a not insignificant role in uh, the Vietnam War, as we'll see, and also was a major center for US intelligence. Um, and even more surprising, perhaps, why did the British accept and even at times encourage a North Vietnamese presence uh, in the colony? Uh, so I'd like to begin with a brief overview of the history of the DRV's trade delegation in Hong Kong, uh, its evolution during the periods of the First and Second Indochina Wars and during the American War. And I'm going to call what's commonly known as the Vietnam War uh, throughout this paper, the American War, since we're looking at it from the other side. Um, then we'll turn to examining the British reasons for allowing the trade delegation to exist and continue uh, before finally trying to look a bit at why, um, hypothesize why the DRV uh, wanted to have that trade delegation in Hong Kong. Now, interestingly, uh, the first overtures actually came from the British side and did not concern trade. Uh, in late 1954, so of course the Geneva Conference was signed at the end of July 1954, um, and in late 1954, the Hong Kong mm -hmm. regional manager of cable and wireless contacted the British consulate in Hanoi about whether the North Vietnamese would like to establish telegraph and postal communication, which also helped to increase uh, trade. 
Um, at the end of 1957, um, relations became more formalized because the first trade delegation arrived in Hong Kong, uh, which consisted of four people, um, two translators, one for Cantonese and one for English, and two trade experts. Um, I should almost put them in quotation marks. Um, now, um, nor was um, they were known to, they were actually officially agents of the North Vietnamese Import Export Corporations rather than representatives of North Vietnam, since the UK did not officially uh, recognize Hanoi. Uh, nor was Hong Kong the only non communist place with which the DRV was developing trade. Along with France, they maintained their commerce with Japan, signed an agreement with Indonesia in January 1957 and actually increased trade with India. So they were um, definitely uh, going for trade with Western countries. Uh, the British Council in Hanoi observed that the regime is not wholly content with economic life inside the bamboo curtain. It's uh, interesting that they use bamboo curtain because of course at this period, um, uh, most of the aid was coming uh, from China. Uh, the Soviet Union at this point considered uh, uh, Vietnam to be a Chinese uh, question, uh, responsibility more than their own, although they were starting to have uh, some aid. Now, um, and um, they were, um, the British consul also observed that the North Vietnamese were tempted to buy suitable goods within broad limits of their dollar balance from Hong Kong rather than from socialist countries. Um, and what's interesting is that by the end of um, 1957, the North was exporting considerably more goods to Hong Kong than was the South, although the volumes remained low, about 20 million uh, Hong Kong dollars for the North they were exporting there and about uh, 4 million from South uh, Vietnam. Um, and what's also interesting is that the goods that were throughout um, the war that were throughout this whole period that were being exported were primarily food. Uh, Hong Kong, of course, had a um, was a had a had a massive need for for food, uh, but this was also the time in North Vietnam of um, the uh, of great hunger. It's a time when you have the reckoning of errors after um, the first attempts at collectivization and. Um, uh, also, I mean, from 57 to 60, you have uh, continue. 56 is the reckoning of errors after when they admitted mistakes in the first round of collectivization, but then they just continued with it from 57 to 60. Throughout all this period and after, there was um, there was hunger in North Vietnam, but yet they were still exporting uh, foodstuffs to Hong Kong. Um, and uh, while certain luxury products would later be sold, such as silk, foodstuffs stuffs remain the bulk of DRV exports to Hong Kong, including live animals and um, cereal products. So there's evidence that um, some British, uh, that, that Hanoi was interested in buying goods from non-communist economies at the time. Um, and uh, the Ministry of Commerce in Hanoi certainly uh, claimed that it wanted to get tons of Western products, that it wanted to even establish a, um, a trade delegation in London, which of course, uh, as in Paris, but which of course London was never going to agree to. Um, and um, uh, they wanted to buy, they said they wanted to buy pharmaceutical supplies, chemicals from the UK, all these things. Um, and in fact, uh, the fact in 62 even, uh, the British consul in Hanoi um, wrote that two British businessmen actually showed up at the consulate um, and that they had met, uh, they had been at the Canton Fair and they'd been invited by the North Vietnamese to come. Um, and they seem uh, interested in UK machinery, but also in selling a lot of goods to uh, the British, which the UK businessmen termed unrealistic. Their goods weren't that interesting. Um, now, it's impossible to evaluate how serious these plans were and whether they existed outside the Commerce Ministry. The British uh, certainly voiced more than a little skepticism about all the grandiose plans uh, for increasing trade and notably opening an office in London. 
Um, and actually, paradoxically, perhaps trade actually declined between the DRV and Hong Kong in the first four months of 1958, although the Hanoi, the DRV Commerce Ministry said this was only temporary. Um, and, um, you know, they claimed they had contracts, which the Hong Kong government claimed they'd never heard of, they had no knowledge of. Um, so there were a lot of doubts about the DRV's delegation claim about boosting commercial exchanges. Um, they did, um, trade grew only slowly. And um, in 1964, exports from the DRV had hardly changed from the 20 uh, million Hong Kong dollars of 1957. Um, but what's interesting and what's really important to notice here is the imbalance. Um, the DRV was um, exporting much, many, many more things to Hong Kong than they were importing. Although they kept saying they wanted to have uh, goods uh, from uh, Western countries, they were buying really very few. A lot of it consisted of plastic in order to wrap uh, things for sale in. Now, uh, the initial delegation, as I said, consisted of four men. And in 1958, the possibility of a fifth member was accepted, although the Hong Kong authorities would sometimes delay approving visas to keep the number lower. In 1961, North Vietnam asked to increase the number to six, which the colonies uh, authorities accepted, although later the DRV themselves reduced the number to five, a number which the colonies sought to maintain. Um, officially, as I said, the trade uh, representatives did not work for the DRV government, but for the North Vietnamese Import and Export Corporation. They were classified as commercial visitors rather than as representatives of a government and kept on six month visas. Now the DRV trade delegation were certainly discreet and that's another red flag. Uh, they did not even put a sign up on their offices. Um, and uh, to, um, uh, and to, to, to notify who they were. Um, indeed, the government did not even seem concerned either about the title of their representative or about proclaiming their presence in any official way. A foreign official, office official noted that they seem to be confining themselves to buying and selling. In 1961, the UK consul in Hanoi noted that my opinion is that the North Vietnamese authorities are so bent on this trade that they would not risk prejudicing it by attempting to use these officials for nefarious purposes. Now, it doesn't take much imagination to think that nefarious purposes means spying, uh, in fact. Um, so uh, now I'd just like to say a few words about the role of the UK, about which we know a lot. Why did the British tolerate the North Vietnamese trade delegation in Hong Kong? It certainly was not because the trade was in any way interesting for the colony. Um, in 1958, a Hong Kong official stated clearly that the view here is that the prospects of trade with South Vietnam are potentially better than with North Vietnam. However, uh, by having that trade delegation in Hong Kong, um, they actually infuriated um, the South Vietnamese who started a, a campaign against it. Um, the vulnerability, now uh, certainly a lot of the reason is the vulnerability of Hong Kong after the communist takeover of China. Uh, the UK of course was a fading power and realized that in case of an attack, not only could it not protect the colony, uh, but it would not even be capable of defending it long enough to organize an evacuation. This meant, of course, that there is only one power in the region that could defend the colony, the US, but the US did not consider it vital to their um, interests. At the same time, the UK feared that any pronounced US involvement in the colony would attract Chinese hostility and possibly war. Uh, Tracy Steele as well summarized the situation London fell, found itself in. Uh, during the 1950s, the British performed a balancing act, seeking to discourage the Chinese from taking action against the colony by convincing them that the United States would intervene to defend it, while simultaneously interesting the Americans in Hong Kong's fate, but not allowing them to establish a foothold that the PRC might perceive as a threat. And in practice, of course, this meant the uh, UK became the first Western country to recognize uh, communist China, even though the the Chinese refused to recognize Britain uh, in return or exchange ambassadors. Um, 
And um, the British were forced to tolerate a, an important mainland Chinese presence in the colony. Uh, London sought to prove the value of the colony to the Chinese, especially through trade. And Hong Kong became an important market for Chinese products and thus provided Beijing with not insignificant amounts of Western capital. So a lot of the strategy in uh, the British faced with Hong Kong was to convince the Chinese that it was better for them not to invade and take over Hong Kong, that they could make out better if they let Hong Kong alone, um, if they left it alone. Now, although Anglo-American relations clearly had priority for the British over those with China, as their participation in the Korean War shows, uh, the same was most definitely not true for Anglo-Soviet relations, especially after the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, as early as 1956, the USSR itself asked to open a trade office in Hong Kong, and which the British refused. They sort of hedged around uh, and tried to delay the whole thing, but ultimately they refused it. Uh, they reasoned that they, the, they, the Soviets, would in all probability um, uh, use it for the furtherance of communist penetration and subversive of activity, which of course was exactly what the Chinese uh, were doing. So there was a big double standard with regard to uh, European communist powers and Asian communist powers. Um, indeed, fear of these Chinese activities became a justification for keeping the North Vietnamese trade delegation open. As one Commonwealth Office official explained in 1967, any move against the Vietnamese would probably provoke Peking into violent denunciation and further charges that Hong Kong was serving United States imperialism over Vietnam. It might also be taken up by communist extremists in the colony. So what happened is that maintenance of the trade delegation became linked to the maintenance of stability in Hong Kong for the British. And so they felt they had to keep it open in order to kind of calm the Chinese and make sure they weren't uh, infuriating the, the pro-communist elements in the Chinese in uh, Hong Kong. Um, and um, the Foreign Office argued that it was to the advantage of Hong Kong to encourage the improvement of trade with North Vietnam as part of a general plan to develop trade with the colony's neighbors. So even though North Vietnam was a communist country and thus likely to be up to subversive activity, and furthermore, one that Britain's close ally, the US, saw as an enemy, it would still be allowed to open a trade office, increase the number of its members, and maintain it even after Washington was engaged in open warfare with Hanoi. Um, so given Hong Kong's vulnerable position, uh, the, the, the British idea was to keep as friendly relations as possible with all of Hong Kong's neighbors. Um, of course, uh, this was not the only reasons for Britain's acceptance of the DRV's trade delegation, uh, for it was also linked to their desire to protect the British consulate in Hanoi. Now, the British consulate in Hanoi had been founded just after World War II, significantly by Arthur Trevor Wilson of the Secret Intelligence Service, the SIS, better known as MI6. Uh, who became the first consul there. So from the very beginning, the Hanoi consulate existed for intelligence gathering. Later in 1954, the British would be co-chairman with the Soviets of the Geneva Conference. They used this position to justify uh, remaining in Hanoi and even opened a second consulate in Haiphong, which lasted until 1959. So the British presence in Hanoi was thus essentially motivated by political and strategic reasons. Indeed, the Foreign Office actually wanted to close the consulate in Hanoi in, late, in the late 1950s, but um, the SIS um, refused. They protested. They insisted that the post had great intelligence value. Uh, the Foreign Office and the SIS reached an agreement. The post would remain, but with only two members, one from the SIS, one from the Foreign Office, and the SIS would pay all the costs. Later, Harold Wilson, uh, prime minister from 1964 to 1970, so during most of the American war in Vietnam, uh, found the consulate a useful bargaining chip with the Americans. Uh, the Americans singularly failed throughout the Vietnam War to get uh, human intelligence. And the British consuls provide at least some firsthand information on living conditions, infrastructure, political developments in the DRV government, and the impact of bombing raids, among other things. 
All telegrams from Hanoi went to Saigon where they were shared with the American embassy there. Furthermore, Brian Stewart, consul from 1967 to 68, regularly flew to Saigon to meet with American Admiral John McCain in Saigon. Uh, Stewart even tried to get information about McCain's son, the future senator, um, then a prisoner of war in North Vietnam, and tried unsuccessfully to visit him. So Wilson also made a number of failed attempts uh, to mediate peace, with probably the most famous and strangest being the dispatch of a junior minister, Harold Davis, to Hanoi in July 1965, which the least one can say did not go well. Um, Wilson seems to have envisioned the possibility of the UK repeating its role as co-chair of the Geneva Conference during the Paris peace talks that began in 1968. This became an additional justification for maintaining as close a contact as possible with North Vietnam. So Wilson's own personal delusions of being a great peacemaker, um, something which seemed to infuriate Johnson, uh, who couldn't stand Wilson actually. Um, probably his involvement might have made peace even harder. <laughs> but anyway, he was very uh, focused on that. Um, of course, um, the UK also had other interests in the region, notably Malaysia and Singapore. Um, these two colonies had gained independence in 57 and 58, re respectively, but the British had fought a communist insurgency in Malaya in the years after World War II, and they continued to worry about communist infiltration afterwards, so they wanted to keep an eye on all Chinese activities uh, in the area. Um, <clears throat> So um, paradoxically, perhaps protecting the UK's consulate in Hanoi, in part to help protect Hong Kong's security, became the major reason for allowing Hanoi's presence in Hong Kong. As another Hong Kong official put it in 1959, we have no interest in the presence of this delegation and only tolerate its existence to help the consul general at Hanoi. Uh, the onset of the American war did not change this policy. Um, and, um, you know, basically uh, in 1968, a foreign office official said, each time the visas for members of the trade delegation become due for renewal, or each time there is a new applicant wanting a visa, we like to look at this against the current trend of Anglo-North Vietnamese relations generally, and especially against the way in which the North Vietnamese are treating our mission in Hanoi. Still, the Hong Kong authorities drew limits uh, about how far they would go to protect the Hanoi consulate. Um, they refused to do anything, you know, uh, Hanoi, uh, the Hanoi consulate wanted them to punish um, the trade delegation for their treatment, the treatment, sometimes not very nice treatment they received from the Hanoi authorities. Um, this Hong Kong refused to do because they said it implies a degree of recognition which we in Hong Kong would be most reluctant to grant. Of course, this did not keep the consul uh, in Hanoi from occasionally threatening uh, the DRV authorities that something could be done uh, to expel uh, the um, trade delegation. Um, now, the problem was, of course, that after active fighting began between the United States and North Vietnam in 1964, the British found the trade delegation to be an embarrassment in Washington. Uh, never enthusiastic about the prospects of commercial dealings with North Vietnam, uh, by 1966, the Hong Kong government was telling John Colvin, the, then the British consul, consul in Hanoi and uh, yet another SIS agent, we are not in fact at all anxious to increase our trade with North Vietnam because of our interest in maintaining the best possible relations with the United States, which is our single largest export market at present. Hong Kong also undoubtedly benefited uh, economically from the Vietnam War with the Americans buying many supplies there and using it as a major spot for leave. But this created tensions of its own with any excesses of USGIs receiving a great deal of publicity in the pro-communist press. Uh, further problem with shipping since Chinese government agencies owned a number of ships which they registered at the colony. These frequently traveled to North Vietnam and some of these were hit in US bombing raids which meant that uh, there would be outcries in parliament that a UK ship had been hit by US bombs. Uh, but as the British would then say, um, they were actually uh, 
you know, Chinese uh, ships that had registered them there. And the governor of Hong Kong, however, refused to take any action against these Chinese ships that were being registered in Hong Kong because they feared it might lead to trouble with the communists. Uh, to further complicate the matter, the South Vietnamese lobby to the U.S. Congress continually drew uh, attention to the situation, which meant that the U.S. Congress was frequently attacking and criticizing um, the British. Um, but in spite of this, the delegation remained in Hong Kong throughout the war. Uh, now I'm going to just close in a couple of minutes, but before I close, of course, I'd like to just say a few words about why did the North Vietnamese want this delegation there? Uh, it's very hard to know, of course, because um, quite honestly, we don't have the North Vietnamese, uh, as far as I know, they're not open uh, in relation to this subject. Um, Maybe I'm wrong, but in any case, um, if we contrast it to the other major DRV trade delegation in the West, which was in Paris, we can see important differences. Now, if you look at what was going on with the um, North Vietnamese trade delegation in Paris, um, for, and we can see that the North Vietnamese were constantly trying to increase the trade of the delegation and its activities went way beyond uh, the commercial aspect. In late 1961, the delegation began to take on consular functions in defiance of an agreement with the French government. Um, they began to offer visas to people going to the DRV. They even tried to impose it on um, French officials um, like at going to the DRV. In 1962, the uh, DRV consulate uh, announced that French people, um, uh, so sorry, um, the, that same year, the trade delegation felt comfortable enough to look into buying their own buildings. So they had the, they bought their own building. Uh, they demanded an attestation from the French foreign ministry, the Quai d'Orsay, to do so. The Paris trade delegation organized huge annual Independence Day parties in chic hotels, which the elite of uh, left-wing politics attended, the gauche caviar, as they're called in uh, France. Um, and from 1962, they were actually allowed to fly their flag there. Um, and in con and most famously, of course, um, the presence of the Paris, uh, the North Vietnamese trade delegation was the main reason that Paris was chosen for the peace negotiations. Uh, supposedly, uh, if I remember well, Kissinger uh, chose Paris because it had the best hotels. All the other places where there were uh, trade delegates, uh, there were uh, there was a representative, um, um, a, a, a representation of um, North Vietnam were in uh, socialist countries where the hotels weren't anywhere near as good as Paris. So he said, we must go to Paris, good restaurants, good hotels. Um, we often don't realize what what is the basis for major diplomatic uh, decisions. Uh, in contrast to this, the Hong Kong trade delegation did not even have a plaque much of the time and kept very quiet. This suggests that the purposes of the two delegations were very different and that neither were fundamentally about trade with Western countries. Paris focused on propaganda activities and was fairly blatant in its attempt to radicalize the Vietnamese community in France, as well as in spying activities. In spite of its discretion, the Hong Kong trade delegation was probably engaged in some espionage. Um, anything else would be surprising given the importance of the American presence there. They might very well have been spying on the Chinese as well. That wouldn't surprise me at all, uh, given the fact that the history of Vietnam and uh, China. Um, uh, however, uh, but a further thing is that British consul in Hanoi and SIS agent uh, John uh, Lugius um, thought that more still was involved. Uh, British intelligence reports suggested that Hong Kong was the main place where the DRV secured foreign currency to pay for the guerrilla war in South Vietnam. So um, SIS uh, was convinced actually um, that they were using Hong Kong and to a lesser extent Singapore to funnel in money, money and to buy um, weapons in fact for the NLF in uh, South Vietnam, which explains the gross trade imbalance. Uh, why uh, they were importing so few things. Um, basically, they had to import a few things in order to keep the Hong Kong authorities happy. But beyond that, uh, they just kept selling foodstuffs and anything they could sell uh, to uh, the um, 
um, to Hong Kong uh, in order to get Western currency. And quite, I could find no record as to where uh, a lot of this um, money went to, and there was lots of re-exporting trade. So it looks like it probably was being spent on weapons. Of course, they were getting weapons as well um, from uh, other areas, uh, from the Soviet Union and all, uh, and China. Uh, but it was certainly being used to finance the guerrilla war uh, with Western um, money. And uh, so, um, and this would also explain why the DRV insisted on exporting large amounts of food there, even when its own po population was in difficult circumstances. Okay, I think I'll stop there and uh, see if there's any questions. Thanks a lot. Um, Question before you ask your question, please introduce yourself. Yes, oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is uh, Alex Taibo. Um, thanks, sorry for, for, for a great presentation. I was just curious uh, uh, in terms of what were the um, PRC and the Soviet Union's reaction to North Vietnam for finding this approach with Hong Kong, uh, kind of like in uh, you know, a trade alternative to a to the commerce. I haven't found anything about that. You know, um, I, there's very little about this Hong Kong connection, and uh, I, I found a few. Th it, it's very funny, even in the British archives, it's very difficult to find. I mean, at Kew, for example. I was um, asking for the colonial office papers and nobody at Q knew where the colonial office papers were relating to Hong Kong and uh, the trade there. And the ones I found were among the foreign office papers. Um, and I, I really don't know about the Soviet Union or China. I mean, uh, I don't read Chinese. I read a bit of Russian, but um, um, I don't even know if, uh, I, I really don't know. Um, that's a good question though. You know, because for me, it's, it's really amazing how they, they started really early in trying to you know, get a connection with Hong Kong and, and the non communists at this particular stage, early when they just got recognition from the Soviet Union, and of course, in the 1950s, uh, in 1950. But, you know, prior to that, Stalin was not um, was, 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 was in question, in doubt about Vietnam and Ho Chi Minh, whether they were true communists or, or not. So, um, yeah, very interesting though. I mean, I think it is interesting that from very, very early on, they're trying to get around uh, the China and the Soviet Union. I mean, uh, that that seems clear in this telegraph agreement with uh, France seems they want stuff to go via Paris. They want to have as many sources as possible where they can have send out their communications, go by Hong Kong so the British can look in, go by Paris, the French might look in, uh, go by, uh, but they can also kind of uh, uh, decide what they want want to send out, yeah, uh, and wh who they don't want to listen in, basically, yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm Sean Pierre at the University of Leeds. Thanks for the presentation. That I think that the detail that you provide is really interesting, and it, it certainly gives a sense that uh, there's probably something to this story, uh, so I, I really enjoyed it. I guess I was wondering, and I know it's very difficult to speak with any certainty about what's happening in Hanoi during this time period. I've spent time with the archives there myself, and you're right, it's, it's, uh, it's not easy going, but um, do you have a sense of who specifically might have been uh, behind the foreign policy approach to non-communist states during this time? Like, do we have a sense of who's sort of calling the shots here at all? And another question maybe is, given that uh, North Vietnam is to some extent divided between uh, the top officials who are closer to the Soviet Union on one hand and perhaps closer to China on the other hand. Was that perhaps a dynamic at play here? I, I, I know it's difficult to speak with too much certainty again, but I'm just curious if you had any uh, uh, hints perhaps or theories. Uh, for the time being, I don't. As I said at the beginning, this is kind of an uh, early uh, research work. And uh, one thing I'd like to do is see if there's anything in the U.S. archives relating to this um, with COVID and all. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> haven't been able to to get over and look. And of course, uh, College Park can be a very frustrating experience too. <laughs> Um, but I, I would like to find this out. Who is it? Uh, I, I, you know, yeah, there's this uh, group that's pushing more. I mean, it seems I, I'm going to take a leap and think that after um, that, probably both want to have some connection there because it is, I mean, uh, the, the Chinese are so active in Hong Kong. Uh, and also, but I'm, I think that probably uh, initially it's uh, the more the Soviet people who are starting out in the early period looking for this uh, and that the Chinese people the group and um, uh, later uh, as uh, they decide on infiltrating uh, that to what is it around 59 is it that the vote is taken to start destabilizing the South. Uh, that they come to the conclusion that um, they'll need Western capital to do it and that Hong Kong is an obvious place to get it. I mean, there also were activities in Singapore um, that the British were monitoring there as well, um, but they seem to have been less than Hong Kong. So I really don't know. I'd love to have any guidance if anyone has any ideas, I mean. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, uh, we have an online question from Tan Go. Thank you for a great paper. I have a question of the role of Chinese traders. Did you find any information about the transnational Chinese trading network that involved in the trade of arms between Saigon and Hong Kong? Thank you. I did not. Uh, once again, the problem is the archives. I mean, uh, most of the MI6 archives, which might, which would probably have material on that, are closed. I mean, if you're not Christopher Andrew, you basically don't get access to them. Um, and uh, um, I mean, I, I had, I came across references. It's, it's very spotty. The archives. It's uh, with regard to the Hong Kong. As I said, I couldn't find the official colonial office archives. I could see references inside the foreign office papers to them, uh, but I couldn't find them. And I, I, I wrote to people at Q. I went and talked to people at Q. And, uh, and Q is in College Park. They're generally um, better organized. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, I came across references to Chinese activities in Hong Kong. Um, there's no doubt about it. I mean, as I said, they were buying, they were renting, they were taking their ships and registering them in Hong Kong. Uh, they also, I mean, I came across a number of references to um, other economic activities in, um, in China. Um, if you uh, if you send me a, a, an email um, or something afterwards, I can probably send you, I have to, I don't have all the lists now, but some files at Q, which might help in that regard. Um, I can't think of them now, no. Any more questions? Um, we don't have any more online questions. Maybe we could have, oh, one more. Uh. Right. Thanks. Yeah, if you send me an email, I can tell you. Thank you. I will send you. No, that. that's all. Yeah, it's just okay. that. Yeah, you should be able to find my email address online. I mean, yeah. I, I wonder as well, um, during the French colonial period, there's a relatively small Vietnamese community in Hong Kong. I, I think Ho Chi Minh spent a bit of time in Hong Kong, for example. Um, I wonder if that might be an angle to consider. Is there still a Vietnamese population in Hong Kong during the war? And if uh, perhaps they might have had some role in the uh, objectives of the North Vietnamese Foreign Ministry or some of the activities going on. I, I, I'm not sure myself. I mean, that's one of the things I tried to yeah, find out yeah. about, uh, because I mean, it's clear in Paris that the Paris trade delegation is going and uh, it's even going openly addressing workers at like a Peugeot, I think, who I think was a Renault or Peugeot that had large numbers of um, Vietnamese workers. And they're very open about it. But the the trade delegation in Hong Kong is incredibly secretive. And unless one day I get access to the MI6 files, I think it's going to be uh, uh, hard to, uh, to, to, to find out. I mean, yeah, they, I mean, the reports that came in said they were sticking to themselves. And, uh, you know, when uh, at one point the, um, 
uh, the British um, uh, consul in uh, North Vietnam, Vietnam, you know, they, they kept having this fiction that um, Hong Kong and uh, the UK were two different entities. And uh, so the, uh, the British uh, consul says to them, well, if we close, then we can close down the Hong Kong uh, trade delegation and that'll have no impact on uh, this uh, consulate. And the guy went white as a sheet, he says. And so, I mean, it was, really important to the North Vietnamese to keep this open. And they certainly didn't draw attention to it. The question is why? And the memoirs of MI6 agents and all say spying, but then if they weren't interacting that much, as far as I can tell, they weren't interacting that much with the Vietnamese community. They weren't interacting that much with the um, um, Chinese community, and they were uh, keeping the number below the limit, whereas in Paris, they kept finding all sorts of ways of bringing in local people. And um, um, I don't know if you know, the, in Geneva, the Chinese were at the consulate in Geneva, the Chinese had uh, come up with a number of different ways of bringing in extra people. And so they would have cooks, uh, they would hire uh, local Chinese, they would just keep expanding, expanding. And the North Vietnamese kind of copied this and did the same thing in Paris. They were saying, oh, we need to have a Vietnamese cook because uh, people can't take French food, you know, things like this, and French cooks aren't any good and things like this. And so they were just saying this. In Hong Kong, they were dead silent. Um, was it that they needed that Western capital so much that they were uh, doing that? But I mean, the MI6 reports I said said they were engaged in spying work, which means probably, I mean, Hong Kong was the place where um, hundreds of thousands of American servicemen went on leave. Um, and so it would be, an, uh, along with the fact it was a big base for uh, US uh, operations, but probably, I mean, and how were they getting this? I, I haven't found it out yet. I may never. <laughs> and I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Sean uh, Fear, who is a lecturer in international history at the University of Leeds. Um, he has his doctorate from Cornell, uh, and he has a forthcoming book, uh, Theaters of Diplomacy, Domestic Politics and Civil Society in U.S.-South Vietnamese Relations. Um, and he also co-wrote a book called The Republic of Vietnam, 1955 to 1975, Vietnamese Perspectives on uh, Nation Building. And he's going to talk to us today uh, about anti-war populism in rural South Vietnam. Uh, oh, I'm terrible at pronouncing Vietnamese names. <laughs> um, and the 1967 presidential election. I won't even offend you by trying to pronounce it. So let's uh, hand over to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, uh, Lori. And uh, thanks as well to Lutna for helping to put this event together uh, and really to everyone else who was involved in making it happen. It's uh, always a good day when uh, there's an email invitation to spend some time in Paris uh, in, in one's inbox. So I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, I'll maybe just sort of quickly say by way of introduction, this uh, theme and, and topic that I'm going to share today uh, will form uh, the bulk of the first chapter in the book that I'm working on, which uh, Laurie mentioned. And essentially, um, to put it simply, which has taken me some time to do, uh, the basic argument, I suppose, that I'm trying to make is that the question of political legitimacy uh, in South Vietnam during the war is crucial. Uh, and in particular, uh, the South Vietnamese uh, military state's ultimate failure to achieve legitimacy, even among anti-communist constituents, uh, is a really decisive, uh, but I think overlooked part of the war. It's been uh, well noted now for some time that much of the Vietnam War scholarship is very uh, American focused. Recently, uh, there are a number of scholars who have used Vietnamese sources to uh, focus in a bit more detail on South Vietnam, but much of this is on the Ngoding Xiem period before 1963. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's really no uh, even sort of basic political history of South Vietnam after 1965. And I'm hoping to, I suppose, cover a, a gap, but beyond that, um, 
try to make the case that this is an extremely significant uh, topic and, uh, and time period indeed. The 1967 presidential election that I'll cover is often little more than a footnote in most uh, English language American accounts, but uh, as I say, I think it's quite important to consider here. Uh, and this is drawing on research that I've done using American embassy sources, uh, South Vietnamese official government records at the National Archives Center 2 in Ho Chi Minh City, uh, and South Vietnamese newspapers, which I think are a, a really important but, uh, but overlooked source. So to um, understand why the 1967 election, whose outcome was really, I would argue, never truly in doubt, is still an event worthy of uh, much more careful attention. Uh, I think it's first important to get a sense of the context in which it was conducted. So in 1963, the South Vietnamese president, uh, a man named Ngo Dinh Diem, is assassinated. Uh, the Americans and the South Vietnamese military who orchestrated the coup hope that this will make everything uh, more stable, that it will pave the way for much needed political reforms. And in effect, exactly the opposite happens. Uh, South Vietnam really spirals quickly out of control. There are recurring student demonstrations, uh, street fighting between Catholic political groups and Buddhist political groups, uh, a series of regional uprisings in central Vietnam in uh, 1965 in the Central Highlands, again in 1966. As a result, communist momentum swells uh, the South Vietnamese military is sort of constantly fighting uh, within itself. Multiple coups follow, plot attempts, scheming. Um, it's really quite a chaotic period. And of course, I'm, I'm not really doing it justice here, uh, but in, in the interest of time, I, I hope you'll forgive me. Suffice it to say, though, by uh, 1966, there's growing recognition within uh, South Vietnamese anti-communist political communities that things need to change. Um, the American public is growing increasingly skeptical of the war, which is always important, uh, but I think it's really South Vietnamese uh, domestic stability and more importantly, legitimacy, uh, which uh, everyone in the South starts to recognize will be vital. Finally, the prevailing figure uh, in charge of South Vietnam at this time, a general named Nguyen Cao Ki, uh, is forced to relent after a significant Buddhist uprising in central Vietnam, uh, sort of northern South Vietnam at the top of the map here. Um, much of northern central, or, or sorry, northern South Vietnam, central Vietnam is lost to government control during this time period. It takes uh, pitched battles between different elements of the South Vietnamese military to restore order. So there's a sense that something needs to give way here. And this really paves the way for the presidential elections um, that, that, that follow. Uh, provisions are made for a new bicameral assembly in the South with a Senate and a lower house loosely modeled after the American political system uh, and a new constitution as well. But it's really worth noting, I think, that the prospect of holding elections was seen as a considerable uh, political gamble in 1966 and, uh, and 1967 when the elections take place. Um, there's a risk that this will only inflame the situation, that it will lead to even more uh, infighting, possibly even a military coup. Uh, as one American official put it, we need to take out coup insurance. Uh, civilian politicians in the South, so these are um, loosely affiliated anti-communist politicians in the South, uh, have very little confidence uh, that the military will actually permit a civilian candidate to win. And here I think it's worth noting, after the fall of Ngo Dinh Diem, uh, South Vietnam really is a military state, especially outside of Saigon. Uh, the, Basic elements of the bureaucracy in much of the countryside are military. Um, there's virtually no other nationwide political institution, uh, save, of course, for the Vietnamese communist movement. So as, uh, as one sort of skeptic puts it, the military already controls almost everything in the country. Uh, there's really no point in provoking them during the election. So why do they still matter then? Why, if there's already a sense that the elections serve mostly just to ratify military power, why are they still worth taking seriously? 
Well, for many uh, anti-communist constituents, and I'm using this as just a kind of loose coverall term, it's really quite a diverse political community, people who are not uh, actively affiliated with the communist movement, but I, I just use anti-communist here for the point of simplicity. Um, for many of them, the reality of preponderant military government, preponderant military power, does not negate the need for elections that they hope will achieve a number of important objectives. Um, first of all, they hope that the elections will help resolve tensions between native southerners and northern refugees, many of whom came to the south after 1954. This is a really uh, important political factor in the south, but often overlooked, I think. Um, they hope that it will ease tensions between civilian politicians and the South Vietnamese military. Uh, and above all, they're really hopeful that the elections will help restore a measure of broader popular legitimacy uh, to an anti-communist or non-communist government in the South. Um, in other words, the fact that they were not expected to be uh, truly contested did not necessarily diminish their importance. What these civilian politicians are hoping for is that the elections and the constitution will pave the way uh, for an admittedly mostly military government, but one that is much more uh, transparent, much more responsive to constituents' concerns, um, one that is bound by the rule of law. So I, I think it's interesting. Their constitutional uh, ideas, their sense of what constitutional order looks like, uh, arguably dates back to the French period, uh, where these same sort of non-communist political groups found themselves um, making very difficult compromises with uh, French colonial authorities. And I think that that relationship is uh, to some extent revived only here with the South Vietnamese military. There is a good deal of debate over what form the elections will take. For example, uh, who is even allowed to qualify in the first place? Uh, should there be some sort of runoff between the final two candidates? Um, what everyone at least initially does agree on is that there needs to be some sort of uh, cosmetic symbolic role for civilian politicians. Um, everyone agrees that a presidential ticket headed by the two most powerful men in the military, uh, Nguyen Nguyen Ki and Nguyen Van Thieu, and more on them in a minute, um, would be a disaster. Uh, as one uh, observer put it, quote, even if they could win it legitimate, uh, legitimately, with which most experts doubt, uh, few in Vietnam or elsewhere would believe it was not a rigged affair. Um, this is actually a rather fateful remark, as we'll see, and, uh, and one that I think uh, reveals just how little the U.S. was actually able to choreograph events in Saigon, uh, in spite of its massive military commitment at this point. So everyone agrees a, a kind of all military ticket would be a disaster. There needs to be some sort of symbolic role for civilian politicians uh, in the results that follow. There's a good deal of uh, speculation about who, uh, which civilian candidates will be involved in this long before the election uh, uh, even begins. And it's always tempting for me to go really in depth on South Vietnamese politics here because it's just so fascinating and, and kind of intricate and complex. But uh, suffice it to say, South Vietnam, anti-communist Vietnam is incredibly fragmented and divided between different uh, regional affiliations, different political groups, um, different religious factions, Buddhists, Catholics, uh, a number of minority religious groups in the Mekong Delta. There is a sense at this time that the communist movement represents uh, perhaps at most a plurality here, but not an overall majority. Um, I, I haven't really seen anything to suggest otherwise in the documents that I've looked at, but they're kind of the uh, first among equals, if you like, just because they have uh, a nationwide presence. Anti-communist South Vietnam, on the other hand, uh, amounts to much less than the sum of its extremely fragmented parts, just because there's so much division within the anti-communist movement. And so the elections are intended, I suppose, to provide uh, a more concrete constitutional basis that everyone can rally behind. Um, these are some of the figures, the civilian figures who contest things here. And I, I won't go into too much detail here about their biography. I, I just wanted to share this briefly to outline um, some of the different ways that South Vietnam is fragmented here. And unfortunately, um, my uh, 
software wouldn't allow me to arrange these in the uh, in the order that I mentioned them. So I'll, I'll just try to point them out here. Uh, so this is Chen Benhu, who's a, a kind of native southerner, a former school teacher, uh, former Saigon mayor, mayor, very popular with mostly liberal, uh, urban, constitutionalist uh, sort of bourgeois elites in Saigon and some of the other big cities. Uh, two other candidates who are really popular with uh, native southerners, this kind of urban um, liberal constituency are uh, Fan Katsu here and Fan Kwan Dan here. So the three of them together are the, the kind of leading candidates of, um, of urban South Vietnam, people who really want to see the military bound uh, by a kind of constitutional order. Uh, some others that I'll mention uh, here is uh, Nguyen Hoa here and his counterpart, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Vu Hong Han. These two men are uh, leaders of the former Vietnamese Nationalist Party, at this point fragmented between uh, Southerners, Nguyen Hoa here, and Northerners, Vu Hong Kang. So again, don't worry too much about the details. I guess it's just to give a sense of how um, sort of fragmented and factionalized uh, everything is. Even the Vietnamese Nationalist Party can't form a kind of consensus between Northerners and Southerners. Um, there's also uh, Pat Dupi here, a uh, leader of a different group, the Dai Viet Party, uh, a, a less prominent candidate, Phan Huica. He's kind of interesting because his big uh, campaign idea was uh, total war, by which he meant the South Vietnamese liberation of North Vietnam by force. Um, and then finally, uh, a, a man uh, who we'll learn about in, uh, in quite a lot more detail later, Chen Van Hu, Phan Kak Su, Phan Quang Ran, Nguyen um, Hoa here, Vu Hong Kang, uh, this is Ha Tuk Ki and Phan Quy Ke. Uh, again, um, the names might be of interest to real specialists in South Vietnamese history, but I just wanted to give you a, sh a sense of the kind of disparate political elements um, that this election is designed to bring together and just to sort of reinforce, I suppose, how uh, fragmented and, uh, and factionalized South Vietnamese politics really is. Um, Probably most important of all uh, during this time period are the two leading military figures, though. These are the people who really uh, wield power in the South during this time. Uh, the first figure who I've mentioned already, Nguyen Khao Ki, uh, was born in the north, uh, just west of Hanoi. So he's a northerner. That's quite significant during this time period. Uh, he tries to present an image of himself as being this kind of dashing figure, uh, courageous, but also impulsive, uh, flashy, outspoken and emotional. He, he always made a point of uh, being photographed wearing his aviator glasses and a pink scarf, which you can see here. Uh, he's uh, kind of conspicuously drinking a bottle of Coca-Cola here. Um, and that's not incidental to how he presented himself. Uh, he really rose to prominence as a marshal in the Air Force, where he gained this reputation for uh, being daring, but uh, perhaps a bit reckless. And this uh, persona that he uh, attempts to present, this kind of dashing action man, uh, wins him a lot of prestige within the military. Uh, he's quite popular among fellow Northerners, so again, people who left the North and headed South after 1954. On the other hand, this kind of swaggering, uh, arguably at times impetuous attitude really earned him the uh, enmity of older, uh, more native Southern South Vietnamese, um, especially a, a kind of old money, if you like, South Vietnamese landowning class. They see him as really the epitome of a kind of brash, uh, arrogant Northerner. And his uh, predilection for off the cuff remarks uh, which Western media wasted little time in reporting. For example, uh, speaking favorably about Adolf Hitler on occasion. I, I think he probably didn't really understand the implications of that remark. Um, led to him being seen among American officials as, uh, uh, as a bit unreliable. On the other hand, uh, Nguyen Khao Ki's real rival, so Nguyen Khao Ki's main rival in the military uh, is this man, Nguyen Van Thieu. Um, and I think these images suggest the ways in which they differed. Uh, Thieu was introspective, where Key was gregarious. He was very cautious, while his rival is spontaneous. 
uh, aloof, famously, while he is charismatic. Uh, so as a result, Teal is regarded as being a bit less popular within higher echelons in the military, um, a bit less familiar to ordinary people in South Vietnam, uh, but his kind of restraint, his sense of discipline and responsibility uh, endears him to, uh, to native Southerners who see Key as this very kind of brash, uh, arrogant Northern figure. Uh, and the personalities really are important again, because they reflect this kind of fundamental divide between Northerners and Southerners in South Vietnamese politics. To some extent, uh, the personas that they craft for themselves are uh, a reflection of this fundamental political tension. The United States pledges not to interfere in the election. And as far as I can make out, um, by and large, they really don't get directly involved. They obviously monitor things quite closely, um, but they're not really directly involved uh, in, in the way that you might assume, I think. Um, often uh, when people in the countryside speak to American foreign service officers, they ask, who do the Americans really support? Come on, just tell me. We, we want to know. Are you backing two or are you backing key? Uh, and when the official response, we are neutral in this competition, is recited, uh, people feel disappointed that they're not important enough to get the real answer. Uh, but looking behind the scenes at American documents, I think they do actually play uh, a fairly detached role here. Even before the election formally begins, uh, in Kauki, uh, who again we see here, is already attempting to use his control of the police force, the national police force in South Vietnam to undermine Thieu. Uh, so starting in the spring of 1967, there's a wave of reports that reach Saigon about quite blatant uh, election interference by Nguyen Cao Ki's allies in the military and the police. Uh, this includes things like mailing grenades and bullets to uh, supporters of his rival, uh, transferring unsupportive officials to insecure communist controlled areas, which is not far off a death sentence, frankly, during this time period, given how violent the war is. Um, sometimes firing Nguyen Van Thieu's supporters, uh, manipulating and withholding campaign materials, uh, sometimes arbitrarily detaining uh, rival campaign workers. Uh, media censorship resumes during this run up to the election, even though it was expressly forbidden by the new uh, reform constitution. And very quickly, as a result, uh, the South Vietnamese public, political observers in the South, start to get suspicious. Um, they quickly become uh, cynical about this, given how uh, clear Nguyen Cao Ki's interference is. There's also a, a good deal of debate over what form the election law would actually take. Um, the military is kind of jostling behind the scenes to uh, organize the campaign to its advantage. And at one point, uh, Nguyen Cao Ki's sort of uh, second in command uh, is conspicuously noticed sitting in the observation gallery uh, of the assembly where this is debated, uh, brandishing a revolver and drinking a six pack of beer. So really sending a, a kind of signal that the military is watching carefully. But then uh, in June, Nguyen Van Q formally declares that he is going to get involved in the contest as well. Um, this obviously further intensifies the feud with Nguyen Cao Ki, um, and it really kind of forces events to a crisis. What follows uh, was a bit of a shock to everyone, uh, not least of all the CIA. Uh, finally, at the end of June, the two uh, generals are forced by the rest of the military to this decisive summit. Um, and it, it's still a little bit murky what happened. I haven't really seen a clear account, just some sort of theorizing. Uh, but by all accounts, this kind of top secret summit where the two rivals, Thieu and Ki, uh, are forced to account to the rest of the military is a heated affair, very emotional, uh, fist pounding, uh, bitter recriminations and tears. It emerges as a result of this meeting uh, that Tu will supplant Key as the military's uh, main candidate. And what they'll actually do is run together, although Tu will be the president, uh, Nguyen Cao Ki will be the vice presidential candidate. So clearly, uh, the military has cast its lot with Tu uh, rather than Key, which, um, as I say, surprised just about everyone. 
This is, it has to be said, the absolute worst outcome that could have happened from the perspective of the United States, a joint, uh, in effect, a joint military ticket. Uh, and a decisive, if still a bit uncertain, shift in the balance of power uh, from in Kalki to Tiu. Um, what this means, the military running together rather than each general partnering, partnering with a civilian candidate as uh, the United States had hoped will be that uh, the election increasingly comes to be seen uh, as almost a, a referendum on uh, military rule albeit one in which the military still uh, really holds all of the cards. Um, even some of the more pro-government newspapers, uh, Qingluan, for example, in South Vietnam, uh, are quite upset by what's happening. Um, they're not really angry that military government will prevail. Many people saw that as a kind of inevitability, but they're upset, I suppose, at just how uh, sort of sloppy everything has been uh, by the more uh, outrageous examples of trying to manipulate the vote in the countryside and the fact that uh, uh, the military has in effect run its own ticket rather than partnering with civilians. Um, turning now quickly to the election itself. Um, this is really a unique event in uh, Vietnamese political history, full stop. And I suppose this is why I find it so interesting. Um, all of the candidates are afforded uh, television time. Uh, there are radio broadcasts. They go on this nationwide tour where they give speeches in 12 different cities. Um, it's uh, quite a, a kind of unusual uh, political event in, in Vietnamese political history, really to this day, I think. Um, the goal really, I suppose, is not just to unify uh, political observers, people who follow politics closely in Saigon, but to introduce the new constitutional system as a whole uh, to rural observers. Um, rural South Vietnam is increasingly cut off uh, just because the war becomes so violent. So for example, uh, even taking a taxi ride from uh, Saigon to the nearest provincial capital about 30 minutes down the road uh, is seen as incredibly risky indeed without some sort of military escort. Uh, the flow of uh, newspapers from Saigon to the countryside kind of grinds to a halt. So this is really the uh, anti-communist political system's attempt to re-engage uh, with the rural population, to show them that there's something here worth supporting uh, as a counter to the Vietnamese communist movement. And it's, um, I suppose, something of a, a kind of performance of democracy. As I say, everyone expects the military is going to win, but this is an opportunity for civilians to uh, air grievances, Offer, uh, offer constructive criticism, uh, point out the many flaws of military rule, and uh, in theory, I, I guess, uh, hope for a military that is more responsive to them. But um, there is a, a bit of a surprise. This is a, a final candidate who I haven't mentioned yet, uh, the, the man who I've named my uh, paper after, Chung Bing Zhu. Um, Chung Bing Zhu had a somewhat spotty background. He was a kind of obscure lawyer on the fringes of Saigon society during the Ngo Deng Xiam period. Uh, at one point, he was arrested for writing a bad check, although it's suspected this was possibly on political grounds. But needless to say, he was not a figure that carried a good deal of uh, esteem or enthusiasm in Saigon. Um, Zhu uh, is able to get his name on the ballot basically by keeping secret about what he was actually going to be campaigning on until after his candidacy was uh, confirmed, which is uh, quite prudent as it turns out. And he's really remarkable because his campaign is based entirely on a very simple, uh, very straightforward call for peace. Um, the war should end. Uh, the North and the South should negotiate with each other. Uh, the Americans should stop bombing North Vietnam as a pretext in negotiations. There should be an immediate ceasefire, uh, the withdrawal of foreign troops. Uh, and it's quite an unexpected platform uh, to feature so prominently in the campaign. Again, it's telling that he kept quiet about this until after his candidacy uh, was, uh, was approved. So he takes a really... Uh, effective advantage of television appearances such as this one, these radio broadcasts, this kind of uh, barnstorming set of uh, campaign speeches where the candidates all go to the countryside. Um, 
American officials notice him. They uh, note that his message is clear and effective. Um, but nobody during the election itself really expects all that much from him. They think he might get about maybe 4% of the vote, maybe 8% at most. So moving, moving ahead quickly to the result itself, uh, and I'll, I'll try to wrap things up quickly here. It's really no surprise who ultimately wins. Uh, the military prevails, but it is a bit of a surprise just how low their tally of the vote is. Um, they were hoping for about 50%. Uh, nothing like the previous elections in South Vietnam where the winner had 90% or 95%, that would be uh, a bad look, um, but they're hoping for about 50%, a kind of clear mandate. In the end, they only get 34%, which is quite surprising, uh, given that there are large areas of the country where they effectively just administer the vote to their advantage, where they just line people up, uh, tell them who to vote for, and, uh, and, and that's how it proceeds. Generally speaking, the more uh, media scrutiny there is on particular parts of South Vietnam, the more uh, transparent and reliable the results are. But in remote parts of the country, um, the military really calls the shots. The uh, preferred candidates of uh, elite southern bourgeois constitutional liberals come in third and fourth place, respectively. Uh, quite a disappointment for them. They'd hope to be um, much more prominent as the kind of main civilian opposition to the military. Um, the older parties, who I mentioned briefly, the Vietnamese nationalists and uh, the Diet Viet Party of Hathukki are humiliated. They're basically non-factors. Um, they get negligible uh, uh, vote showings. And the uh, big surprise, I suppose, I, I hope the suspense has been slowly mounting this whole time, uh, is a very uh, unexpected, strong second place finish. Uh, for Chung Bing Zhu. He gets 17% of the vote, uh, which doesn't sound like much, but consider there are 13 other civilian candidates uh, deliberately uh, to split the vote amongst themselves so the military would prevail. Uh, Zhu won six provinces outright, uh, was second place in the majority of the other provinces. And there's real uh, panic, I suppose, in Saigon, not just among military officials, but among uh, the kind of more respectable Saigon civilians as well, uh, at just how well Zhu has done, just how well his peace message uh, has resonated with particularly uh, rural voters. There are all these rumors to attempt to explain this. Uh, he's a communist, perhaps. He's a French agent, perhaps. Um, even the Vietnamese communists thought that he was an American spy, perhaps. Nobody really knows what to make of just how well uh, he actually did here. Um, I, I won't go into too much details, I think, on the specific breakdown of his uh, impressive showing, because I, I think we're probably running out of time. Um, but suffice it to say, it is really an impressive showing uh, in context. As I say, it's otherwise, without the election, extremely expensive and dangerous to go to the countryside during this time period. Uh, politicians in Saigon have almost no real grassroots political networks. They spoke, speak mostly for uh, small groups that are strong in specific regions. And this, I think, is really testament to just how uh, resonant Zhu's peace message really is. It hints at a kind of very preliminary emergence of a nationwide rural constituency uh, that has a very different understanding of what the war is all about than what we see in uh, Saigon and a few other large provincial towns where informed civil servants and military figures um, very much see the war as worth pursuing. And that's why I raised the idea of a kind of rural uh, South Vietnamese populist movement here. Now, there's been a lot of scholarship done on populism as a concept re recently. I'm not going to get into that too much. Um, I mean simply populist in the eyes of its beholders. Uh, these kind of urban, civilian, uh, mostly liberal bourgeois figures who are just kind of aghast at how well Zhu does. It really reveals that they don't perhaps uh, represent the country uh, as well as they thought. They tend to uh, recoil from this. They tend to see it as reinforcing the perception that rural voters are uh, unsophisticated. Um, they're really shocked at just how well he does.
the United States is also uh, aghast at its own lack of influence, its own inability to control the course of politics in Saigon. After the election, they uh, prepare plans to, as they put it, quote, exert more influence uh, once everything is settled. So what happens then? Well, Nguyen Cao Ki threatens to arrest Zhu and display him prominently in a cage on the lawn of the South Vietnamese political palace, uh, the, the presidential palace. Uh, Zhu tries to organize a protest immediately after the election at what he sees as blatant vote rigging. Um, he is then in turn arrested by the military on these long-standing, I think, very politically motivated charges of currency uh, manipulation. And this has the effect of turning him into a martyr. Not so much in South Vietnam, where, as I say, his reputation in Saigon is quite checkered, but overseas. And we see here uh, his wife holding a sign very pointedly, I would note, written in English, appealing to an overseas audience. Uh, demanding that her husband be released. Uh, officials in the provinces where he performs best are purged, uh, most notably in, in Penang province, for example. Um, but Zhu's movement ultimately uh, really fizzles out. Um, Zhu tries to align with uh, student demonstrations, with protesting students, and students also gather in the streets of Saigon to protest the result of the election. Uh, but they see Zhu as something as uh, a charlatan. They see him as really trying to commandeer their own movement. Uh, and there's this falling out between him uh, and the other uh, activist uh, protest groups who are contesting the election very quickly. And the thing is that without his access to radio broadcasts in particular that the campaign had uh, allowed for, uh, Zhu really has no ability to reconnect with his rural voters. Uh, the whole affair uh, kind of fizzles out quite quickly after the election. So to quickly wrap things up, I guess South Vietnam remains a country where uh, the most important decisions are still made by the military behind closed doors, um, where the most important political relationships are primarily within the military, often uh, sort of unofficially via these uh, back channel family or, uh, or patronage networks. It takes more than a simple election uh, to really change military power. As I say, the military is almost the only uh, political force existing outside Saigon, uh, just given security requirements uh, as much as anything. But that said, I suppose, as a, a kind of symbol of um, legitimizing constitutional order, uh, a symbol of legitimizing to some extent military government, uh, the South Vietnamese election in 1967, I would suggest, is actually quite important, uh, although it takes a bit of time before the people who are involved in it come to recognize its true significance. Um, it establishes, uh, if nothing else, a rhetorical commitment to the rule of law, even though the reality is often far short. This is still meaningful. Um, it helps usher the end to the turbulence and instability that we see after Ngo Dinh Diem's death in 1963. Uh, it hints, at least, at uh, what a new style of politics, much more rural engagement, uh, might look like. And indeed, even though Zhu himself really disappears after the election, uh, the white dove symbol that he campaigned on uh, appears again and again uh, in uh, South Vietnamese politics to follow. Various candidates try to co-opt this uh, to affiliate what he created with themselves. And finally, these uh, new structures and institutions that come into being alongside the election, the new constitution, uh, the new bicameral assembly, will eventually prove a critical rallying point for anti-communist South Vietnam, especially after uh, the communist Tet Offensive in 1968. Um, it's interesting, the American observers are unequivocal that this was necessary uh, in order for South Vietnam to survive the Tet Offensive as a coherent political entity. Um, they were not initially appreciated. There was a good deal of disappointment and cynicism at the time. Uh, but after the 1968 Tet Offensive, the structures that come into being uh, are recognized by everyone as, uh, as really quite significant. And if I may, I just want to finish by um, 
reading briefly from what I think is one of the most uh, significant and perceptive analyses of this event. So th this is in Vietnamese from a Vietnamese newspaper, but, um, but bear with me here. This is from uh, Chan Van Thuyen, uh, exactly the sort of liberal uh, urban constitutionalist who uh, the elections are designed to win over. Uh, Thuyen wrote, the new play has only just begun. Some call it a tragic comedy. I would call it more tragic than comic. I only see the pains, difficulties, courage, sacrifice of a people who are trying to get out of the bog uh, to clear its way through smoke and fire in search of freedom. I am not as optimistic as those who pretend that if we have an assembly, we can have democracy. Uh, and if we have a popularly ejected regime, we can have peace. But I am not so negative as to think that this is nationalism's last chance. Uh, I am anxious to note that this second republic is deficient at its very beginning and that its existence is furiously threatened at its very birth. Uh, let us not entertain the illusion that the people trust in the action uh, and in the promise of those who, although elected by them, consider them as strangers. Over the past 13 years, they have been oppressed, disregarded, exploited, deceived, and they are fed up with empty words. But in the midst of the current situation, uh, half a loaf of bread is nothing, uh, better than nothing at all. So an interesting reflection, I suppose, on the election and its significance, a sense of urban South Vietnam recognizing that it needs to do much more to link up with uh, neglected rural constituents. And I think it captures the uh, ambivalence, but also the importance of this event within anti-communist South Vietnam uh, quite effectively. Thank you. Maybe just very quickly here, let me explain this image. You'll note that the font is tiny, uh, and that was very deliberate. I spent a long time sort of poring over these newspapers on microfilm in the basement at Cornell. Uh, one of the reasons why the fonts are so small was there was a war between the government and uh, newspaper publishers over the price of newsprint. Um, the government didn't dare, uh, with all eyes on them during the election, impose censorship again directly. So they tried to limit um, journalists by driving at the cost of newsprint. And one of the responses is to print in this microscopic font. Uh, so it, it tells its own story, although it, um, maybe you can sympathize with me. Trying to pour over this and translate it, uh, looking at a microfilm machine was, uh, was not ideal. Right, it's funny because from University of Cambridge. Um, just uh, your point about, I mean, by, by this time, the peace movement has, has become really strong in something, particularly in urban centers. But we don't know what, you know, how, how rural residents will come, how, how, how far they will commit to peace, maybe because they, you know, probably they don't. So the, you said uh, there was some problem between. Uh, Jew and peace movement, leave it to the sector. What was the problem? What was the point of uh, controversy between the two groups? Yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to have the opportunity to clarify that in a bit more detail. Um, in urban South Vietnam, after the election, there are recurring protests. Uh, the image that I showed was of student protesters, but we also see uh, Buddhist political groups, uh, increasingly South Vietnamese veterans, uh, military veterans taking to the streets to protest. Um, in the immediate instance after the election, there's a sense that the election was illegitimate. Uh, that the military uh, tipped the balance in its favor to far uh, a far greater extent that was acceptable. Um, so that's the kind of immediate cause, I suppose, of the demonstrations. But it's worth noting that uh, street protests and demonstrations are really recurring throughout this time period. They die down uh, briefly after the communist Tet Offensive in 1968, but they then flare up again, um, certainly in earnest by 1969, and they continue really until the end of the war. And toward the end of the war, even uh, the most vehemently anti-communist constituents, largely Northern uh, Catholic communities, also um, take to the streets to demonstrate against the military government. It's a number of factors, really. Um, the economy by the mid 1970s is plagued with inflation, uh, which is to some extent the result of the American troops withdrawing. Also, the oil price 
uh, shocks of 1973 uh, result in a very uh, sudden deterioration in the standard of living in the South. Um, but I also think there's real dissatisfaction with military rule, a sense that um, although many acknowledge it's kind of inevitable that there's no civilian institutions that can run the country or that are strong enough to contest the communists, um, dissatisfaction with how the military is running the country, that they're not uh, transparent, they're not binding themselves to the rule of, uh, of law in a way that uh, had been intended with the 1967 reforms, um, that people feel their interests are not being uh, represented. Uh, so that, I think, is a kind of combination of factors, I guess, structural factors like economic uh, uh, hardship, but also real grievance over um, the military's failure to uphold the constitutional systems that I've set up. Yeah, thank you. But I, I would say, I guess, the kind of tragic flaw of these groups is that they have very little rural presence. Um, they really are largely contained to the cities. And that's why I think this uh, arguably kind of incoherent uh, but powerful peace movement that comes from the countryside in the form of Chungbing Zoo is so uh, interesting to consider. Yes, I think it would have been Great. Um, I, I just have a question about uh, if you could explain it in a way of your source. It seems like you rely a lot on um, newspaper here, uh, I, I may assume. And Zhu won, like you said, five to six provinces, first place in like around 20 something provinces. Yeah, place, yeah. Right? Um, I was just wondering, um, you talk about the total disconnection between kind of the rural area and the urban, right? Uh, and we know that, you know, from Saigon, you drive to Guchi, yeah. which is not for half an hour. Yeah. It's very difficult. To, uh, and pretty much areas like this will control, especially the one the, the areas where he won, were controlled by the commons, right? So ha have you, in terms of like source, tried to investigate how the elections were run in these provinces and who were really controlling the election? In that sense, too. I wonder if that would would um, in a way change, you know, how, how you take the here. And, um, you know, you talk about his platform. It seems to me that, you know, when you read his platform here in 1967, it very much aligned with the communist platform when they demand uh, in negotiations for the peace, uh, Paris Peace Prize, um, uh, negotiation, right, agreement. And uh, so I was just wondering, from Zhu's perspective, it seems like all these platforms he's demanding is against historic Americans and the South Vietnamese government. Did he have any other demands toward the North, you know, asking the North to, let's say, withdraw from South Vietnam? And so, for me, it's like, how do the communists view these candidates that you show up there, right, relative to, to and gay? And especially in Zhu, in Zhu, you know, how, how did they view him uh, as a candidate? Uh, you know, there's accusation that they pushed for him to win, right? And, the, and a note to that is that his son was in, yeah, was in 1960, of course, yeah, uh, yeah. In 1965, who later in 1978 was uh, accused by the US government of espionage. So I was wondering how do you contextualize all this stuff? Yeah, those are important questions to consider, and I'm glad you brought them up. So there has always been a suspicion, especially in anti-communist circles in Saigon, that Zhu must have been uh, working with the communists somehow, or that even uh, unofficially they were supporting him. Um, the sources that I draw on include newspapers, but I also look carefully at American sources. And here I, I sort of feel the need to justify that because there's uh, a good deal of hesitation to rely too much on American sources, given how uh, dominant American perspectives have been. But um, for many of the insecure provinces where Zhu does well, they really are the only um, kind of reputable uh, explanation of what's happening there. Just because the Americans have a security presence, they can uh, talk to people in these areas and try to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, so it's a, a combination of different sources. Um, I am very skeptical of the idea that uh, Zhu had any kind of formal relationship with the communists or indeed that the communist side was 
uh, uh, working to help him. Um, the United States took this very seriously. They really were concerned that this was some sort of communist attempt to subvert the election. And they, uh, you know, you can read these great um, meticulous reports breaking down how well he did province by province. And they really couldn't find any kind of clear uh, correlation. Uh, he did do well in some provinces that were controlled by the communists, but there are other provinces where uh, the script is flipped, if you like. So in Bingbing province in central Vietnam, uh, the military won all of the rural areas where the communists were stronger, and Zhu won the cities, uh, uh, Queen Yan in particular, which was perhaps unexpected. Um, this is kind of reversed elsewhere in Longan province. Uh, Zhu does better in the countryside, but Tu wins the cities. Um, in Kim Phong province, which was a kind of notorious communist stronghold throughout the war, uh, it's actually Zhu who does well in the urban towns uh, and, uh, and the military that does better in the countryside. So I don't really think there is a kind of simple um, uh, correlation between Zhu doing well in communist controlled areas. I think that actually one of the uh, Vietnamese nationalist splinter fragments, the Thanh Dai Viet, is more significant in driving his showing. And this is why he does so well um, in some of the kind of prosperous uh, rural towns in the Mekong Delta. Uh, the Thanh Dai Viet's really latch on to him. But suffice it to say, the US at least, which is not the uh, be all and end all, but their best place, just given their security presence, to comment on events in the countryside. Uh, they could never find any evidence of uh, kind of overt communist support for Zhu. There is a book by uh, scholar Robert Brigham, who uh, Brigham interviewed someone, the book is Guerrilla Diplomacy, who claimed that Zhu had some kind of connection with a communist agent, but I don't really regard that as a kind of smoking gun, just because um, just about anyone in South Vietnam was was uh, regularly accused of being a communist agent at some point. It's a kind of uh, recurring accusation. Um, it's really difficult to get a sense of how the communist side themselves regarded this election. The Americans thought they didn't really know what to do with it and just played a hands-off role. But obviously, I'd like to find uh, communist documents that would um, allow me to validate that, I suppose. Um, I spent all summer once looking at the uh, archives in Archives 3 to see if I could find anything, but, uh, but no luck. Um, but one thing that I did come across lately, uh, a colleague of mine, Merle Pribino, shared this with me. It was a speech by Chan Kuo uh, kind of security, high-ranking security official in North Vietnam, uh, where he spoke at great length about Zhu as being an American agent. Um, which at least suspects, uh, signifies to me that Zhu was not in any kind of high level, meaningful way uh, supported or uh, the object of, uh, of uh, uh, a communist intervention, I guess. But it, it's an important question. I, I don't really think it's convincing that he was, uh, and, and I, know, I know the story about his son that you mentioned, but um, I've never seen any uh, concrete evidence to suggest that this was communist manipulation. I think it really was uh, a rural population that bore the brunt of the war, um, that by far bore the brunt of American bombing, uh, communist assassin assassination campaigns, um, essentially uh, demonstrating through whatever means were available to them that they just wanted the whole thing to stop. The breakdown of the 17% voters, uh, how did the United Buddhist Sangha position themselves towards uh, uh, um, yeah, that, that's a great question. Uh, so thank you for the question. And I hope to some extent I've helped to answer the first part of the question, uh, the breakdown of the 17% of voters for Chunding Zhu. Uh, with regard to um, uh, Buddhist responses, in general, um, so that uh, different Buddhist groups uh, often very political Buddhist groups in South Vietnam are quite important during this time period. In 1963, uh, they were arguably the kind of decisive um, spark that led to Ngo Dinh Diem's downfall. Uh, in 1966, political Buddhists in central Vietnam uh, led to this uprising where much of central Vietnam is lost temporarily to Saigon's control. Um, just given their kind of strength in numbers, they really are a political force to be reckoned with. Um, but I haven't seen any evidence of a kind of clear Buddhist position on any candidates in the election, really. Uh, in 1967, um, the biggest of the activist Buddhist groups, uh, the Unquang faction led by Tichi Quang, 
uh, largely sits out of the elections. They regard them as illegitimate. Um, they don't get involved. They uh, don't endorse anyone officially. Uh, there is a smaller, um, more northern Buddhist group uh, led by Thich Tham Cho, sorry, um, which is sort of more loosely affiliated with the military. But I, I don't have a sense that um, at least at a kind of institutional level, Buddhists are driving the outcome of the election. There may well have been many uh, individual uh, Buddhist constituents who voted for Zhu, um, but he wasn't formally backed by any of the uh, main Buddhist hierarchies. But it is interesting to mention that because um, although the Buddhists largely boycotted the elections in 1967 in protest, um, they really reconsider their position quite dramatically after the communist Tet Offensive in 1968, uh, especially events like the communist massacre in the city of Hue, which is a kind of Buddhist heartland in central Vietnam, uh, really disabuse them, I suppose, of the notion that they could expect to prosper or even maintain a kind of measure of religious autonomy under a communist takeover. And so the Buddhists actually organized behind a list of candidates for the Senate elections in 1970, which were established as part of the reforms I described in 1967. Um, and they, they came in first place. They won more votes than anyone else in those elections. And that's uh, sort of what I'm alluding to uh, by the broader significance of this event. Although it was not really recognized or uh, regarded with any real esteem in 1967, it does set in place this framework um, that uh, even skeptics like Vietnamese political Buddhists can latch onto after the communist head offensive. You mentioned um, um, all the differences, religious differences. I mean, I know that a lot of the people who came from the north, the refugees, were Catholics, actually. And I was wondering um, if that was Key's case, or I really don't know anything about these candidates, or was there any kind of religious difference among the candidates? Yes, that's a good question. I think to an interesting extent, there are not really any candidates uh, campaigning on an overtly religious basis. Um, those who do have a formal affiliation with some sort of group or another tend to be more these old political parties, the Vietnamese Nationalist Party or the Diet Viets. Um, but the, the election is not really um, politicized along religious lines. Um, that said, Northern Catholic refugees are a very important constituency here, although numerically they're not um, certainly nowhere near as strong as Buddhist groups. They're extremely disciplined and well organized. Like they, they can really get out the vote essentially. So they have a disproportionate impact on how things go. Uh, and many of them supported the military. Uh, uh, they were kind of torn between Ki and Thieu when they were running against each other. But once the uh, military imposed this joint military ticket, um, then many of them support the military, not because they uh, have a great deal of enthusiasm or esteem necessarily for either candidate, but just because they see the military as uh, secure, um, best able to counter the communists. They don't really trust a civilian candidate, I suppose, to uh, be able to wage the war effectively. But it, it is an important question. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you. I'm Noah from Germany and Korea, and this is just a personal question. Yeah. That the militarism in that time, like 1960s, um, uh, was it supported by female citizens, or were there were there any like specific opposition uh, or like female uh, communist group or student groups? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I don't think there's any um, any evidence of kind of disproportionate support among women for one candidate or another. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that. It's an interesting question more broadly, though, the role that women played on the anti-communist side or the non-communist side. Um, the Vietnamese communists were very active in recruiting women into their movement, uh, in uh, creating prominent roles for women to play. Uh, we don't really see anything uh, to the same extent, at least on the uh, non-communist side. But that said, um, women really are active in elite politics in South Vietnam behind the scenes. Um, this, I, I think, is just fascinating. There's a real sense that um, some of the more prominent male political figures are um, 
are symbolic, like they just kind of wear the uniform and their wives behind the scenes are actually uh, networking, cutting deals with other political wives, the, the kind of real power behind the, uh, the couple as an institution, I guess. And it's very difficult to research that, I suppose, because almost by definition, it's not really put into writing. It's much more um, kind of backroom informal conversations, but some of the most well-recognized figures in the South Vietnamese military, for example, are regarded as just kind of filling the uniform. And if you actually want to negotiate with them, um, you, you have to approach their wife, for example. So women are able, although they're almost entirely excluded from formal political roles with maybe one or two exceptions in the Vietnamese Senate, um, they do exert themselves politically, uh, but, but not in a kind of formal official capacity, I suppose. I don't know if that answers the question, I guess. I don't really have a sense that um, women sort of disproportionately favored one candidate or the other in the election, though. Uh, I'm just here to introduce uh, Laurent Césari, who is Professor of Contemporary uh, History at the University of Artois in Arras. And he specializes in Cold War history, especially the linkages between East Asia and Europe and has over 80 publications, most of them in uh, French. Um, and I will say that I've read quite a number of them. Thank you. <laughs> and, I, uh, and he's a fine historian, I would just like to say. And um, at, uh, among his main publications on Indochina is L'Indochine en guerre, 45 à 93, uh, Les Grandes Puissances et le Laos. Uh, he's written the uh, history on uh, Laos in uh, French. Uh, and the Problème Diplomatique de l'Indochine, 1945 and 1957. And um, his last publication on Indochina is Philippe de Villiers. Uh, de Villiers. De Villiers, sorry. <laughs> de Villiers. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh sorry. God. I'm reading too quickly. Uh, <laughs> L'Anseur d'Alerte, journaliste, uh, historian des relations internationales. Um, and uh, in uh, Kimmer, uh, Sumer Francaise, a transformation du groupe permanent de l'OTAN, un directoire stratégique mondial. So he's written on uh, NATO uh, as well. And so I'm going to hand over now. Uh, Thank you, Laurie. Uh, so my paper is called Business as Almost Usual, because as we'll see, it's, it's about a non event. Uh, Diplomatic relations between uh, the South Vietnam Republic and France were broken off. Uh, on June 24, 1965, on the initiative of the, of the South Vietnamese, France resumed relations on April 13, 1973. And in the meantime, uh, relations between the two states were maintained at the level of consulates. The junta at the head of South Vietnam broke with France to make public its opposition to the project of neutralization of Indochina entertained by French President Charles de Gaulle. And during these eight years, the South Vietnam never harmed the staff of the consulate, but was never shy of retaliating on French nationals and business firms present in, uh, in the country, and even of ransacking the building of the consulate, each time that French policy differed too markedly uh, from its own. Uh, the conditions under which the consulate operated depended on the variations of power relations between the two factions of the junta. Those who accepted a negotiation with uh, North Vietnam and the National Liberation Front, on certain conditions, of course, and those for whom war was the only option. France retained important, although declining, declining economic and cultural interests in South Vietnam in the 60s. During the colonial period, as you all know, industrial activities were concentrated in the north of the, of the country around coal mines and plantations were in the south. And since uh, French firms had left the North Vietnam immediately after independence, what remained of French economic activities after 1954 uh, sorry, was concentrated in the south. Uh, between uh, the bulk of foreign firms operating in the country were French enterprises founded during the colonial era, area. And the South Vietnamese uh, authorities did not spare French interests. Between 1954 and 59, 110 French industrial firm, firms out of a total of 230, and 100 trading firms were closed down 
or sold to the Vietnamese authorities. South Vietnam also bought all French, French uh, rice plantations within the framework of its land reform. But owing to lack of funds, South Vietnam did not nationalize the big French-owned rubber plantations. Uh, and this plantation provided South Vietnam with its most important commodity for export, rubber, generally, which generally accounted for more than two thirds of, the, of South Vietnamese exports in value. Trade of other communities between France and, the, and South Vietnam remained limited for American economic aid to South Vietnam was tied to the purchase of American goods. But French firms also dominated banking, import trade, air transport, uh, naval shipping, rubber plantations, and consumers goods, mostly tobacco and uh, alcoholic drinks, Brasserie, Brasserie and Glacier de l'Indochine, and the uh, BGA Brewery, and the Badstow's tobacco firm, enjoyed almost complete monopolies. The managers of these big firms were an exclusive set and seldom mingled with the Vietnamese. Uh, French uh, cultural influence, another legacy from the colonial period, remained important. Vietnamese elites were fluent in French, since commissioned officers and members of, of the profession of the civil service had been, had been trained in French universities or technical schools. And although South Vietnam founded its own universities after independence, more than 30,000 Vietnamese students were still enrolled in French universities in 1966, and 13 French-speaking primary and secondary schools, deemed the best in the country, operated in uh, South Vietnam. Many French people followed qualified trade, qualified trade in South Vietnam, plantation managers, engineers, doctors, teachers, university professors, qualified employees of Catholic medical institutions, etc. And thus, the scale and scope of French activities in South Vietnam allowed local authorities many opportunities to exert pressures on French authorities. Uh, France acknowledged South Vietnam as the only, legitimate, the only legitimate state in Vietnam. French relations with North Vietnam remained at a consular level, not diplomatic level. But of course, France was also on record as favorable to the reunification of, North, of Vietnam by way of, of, of official contacts between North and South as planned by the final declaration of, of uh, the Geneva Conference of 1954. And this position was anathema for the junta, uh, which, like the United States, wanted the partition to remain permanent, and whose extremist uh, members ambition to conquer the North by military means. Before breaking off with uh, France, uh, South Vietnam waged for 18 months a propaganda drive against France. And I start with, uh, it start, the real topic starts here. Uh, in January 64, as a prelude to the establishment of diplomatic relations between France and people China, uh, the French news agency uh, Agence France Presse, AFP, called for a ceasefire in Vietnam and for contact between North and South as a preliminary, uh, a preliminary step for reunification. And the assembly of notables of, uh, of South Vietnam, a consultative organ, retaliated by calling for breaking off with France, by this, uh, calling for the seizure of all, of all French properties in South Vietnam, and for the deportation of all French business, business chiefs. No action was taken, but soon afterwards, uh, South Vietnam refused to assent to the nomination of, of a new French ambassador to Saigon, Roger Duguardier, arguing that he was a relic from the colonial past, since he had served as diplomatic consul of the French High Commissioner in Indochina uh, in the late uh, 40s. Now, immediately after the announcement of the diplomatic relations between France and People's China uh, in January 64, South Vietnam retaliated by issuing Decree 727, a decree which banned several types of imports from France, uh, vine, beauty products, products, cars, but not books or medicine, and which forbade French nationals to work for importing firms. However, in practice, the ban was not absolute and could be evaded. 
And this ban was immediately followed on January 30 by the military coup of General Nguyen Khan, backed by the United States, which consolidated the position of the most rapid opponents, opponents of North Vietnam inside the junta. Nguyen, Nguyen Khan alleged that his coup had been necessary to get rid of a neutralist uh, faction backed by France, which operated inside the preceding cabinet headed by Duong Van Minh. Nguyen Khan was determined to break off diplomatic relations with France as soon as he took power, but the United States dissuaded him from doing so, for fear that France, in retaliation, established diplomatic ties with North Vietnam, as it had just done with China. And furthermore, the United States lacked the personnel necessary to replace the numerous people, French people, who exerted economic responsibilities in South Vietnam. And so Nguyen Khan had to be satisfied with partial measures. Several French nationals were deported. Most French newspapers was, were banned. French newsreels were censored. But Nguyen Khan also commissioned a study for the, on the economic consequences of a break with France. And since the conclusion of this, of this study was that South Vietnam could economically survive if all French civil servants assigned to cooperation with the state were to leave the country, Nguyen Khan did not give up his plan. And so during the summer of, of 1964, Nguyen Khan and General Do Mo publicly raised the possibility to invade North Vietnam. On July 20, on the 10th anniversary of the Geneva Peace Agreement, which was declared a day of national mourning, anti-French demonstrations were held in Saigon. Students ransacked uh, uh, the monument to French soldiers for during World War II and ransacked the building of the French embassy. The South Vietnamese Department of Foreign Affairs answered French, pro uh, French protests that the students had, had indeed acted regrettably, but that it would not tolerate any foreign meddling in the whole affair. Meanwhile, generals were suspected of being too sympathetic to France, and more junior, more junior officers who had graduated from French academies were excluded from influential positions with the approval of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. In 1965, to signal its disapproval of American policy in Asia, France sent only an observer, and not, not a full-fledged full -fledged diplomat, to the spring meeting of the Southeast Asian Treaty Organization. In, in retaliation, South Vietnam put an end to French cultural program on, on its radio and television station, and deported the, the, the chief of the IFP bureau in the country. According to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Sven Van Do, these measures were necessary to appease extremist French bashers. Uh, meanwhile, at the request of a student association, a squad of soldiers and firemen pulled down the memorial to French soldiers, which had been desecrated in uh, July 64. The government argued that it had to take the matter in hand to prevent the disorder. Uh, while this assertion was plausible for anti-colonialism and anti-communism were far from absent in the general population. Students, for instance, and we had some talk about that this morning already, students are about diverse opinions, but some of them were both anti-communist and opposed to the junta, which meant that at least some of the anti-French demonstrations may have been spontaneous. In this context, the Saigon press intensified its campaign against French imperialists. The leaders were papers owned by Americans, Trudeau La Liberté, which called for military action against people China, or owned by a member of the hard right Diet Party, who were close to minister. Chin Luan L'Opinion Veritable, headed by a relative of uh, Fan Win Kwat, the head of government, and Saigon Post, which belonged to Under Secretary Bridiem. According to these papers, De Gaulle conspired uh, with communist power to neutralize Indochina, which would return under French retaliation at, at, at a later stage. De Gaulle was supposed to oppose American policy because he could understand that the US succeeded on a theater where France had failed, where France had failed, sorry. 
And this attitude was the proof that French was no longer influential in Asia. It was also alleged that French firms operating in South Vietnam had come in close contact with the National Liberation Front as an insurance policy. These papers urged the government to take further measures against France, such as the seizure of the plantations or the closing of French cultural agencies. Well, in spite of all this, uh, the United States supposed Guyan can of neutralism, for he had secretly, secretly uh, got in touch with the National Liberation Front. And that is why the US supported another, another military coup by Generals Guyan Venture and Guyan Kelki, who became president and vice president, respectively, in June 1965. And this new team believed that breaking of diplomatic relations with France immediately after the, the inauguration would be a grand gesture which would stiffen the patriotism of the South Vietnamese. And so the breakoff was announced by Nguyen Kao Ki during a press conference on June 24, 1965, five days after, after the announcement of the government, without any prior notice. Foreign Secretary Trent Van Do, a civilian, publicly explained that France was playing in the, hand of, in the hands of North Vietnam. As the instigator of the move, which, may, which aimed at protesting, uh, protesting against French policy, was Guyen Van Thieu. The decision had been taken in haste. Tron Van Dole had claim that he had dissuaded the military members of the cabinet from taking additional measures, such as the seizure of plantation. The American ambassadors, the British ambassadors, the Italian ambassador in Saigon, all advised against breaking off. But the United States were keen on depriving France of any political influence in South Vietnam. Only one member of the junta declared against the rupture. General Tran Van Min, the Secretary of Defense, who feared, that he, who feared that it would bring together France and North Vietnam. And when the US were informed of the position of, of Tran Van Min, they demanded that he be released of his duties. The break did not cause the South Vietnamese to rally, to rally around the flag, since according to the French intelligence service, one half of the population disapproved it, one quarter was indifferent, and another quarter approved, it, he approved the break in principle, but so that, it, so that its timing was ill-advised. De Gaulle let it be known in the French press that he did not care about the break, since political ties between France and South Vietnam had been weak for years, had been being weak for years, sorry. But his reaction in, in private, as far as we can know, may have been much more forceful. From then on, France would be represented in South Vietnam by general consuls deprived of diplomatic immunities. Joseph Lambruschini, until the end of 1967, Laurent Giovanni Grandi from 1968 to July 1970, and Jacques de Follin up to the resumption of diplomatic relations. But except for the lack of a full fledged ambassador, the working of the Saigon station remained much the same. Foreign Minister Tran Van Do allowed the consulate to remain in the building of the embassy and to use a diplomatic pouch and cryptographic means of communications. Agents who held dip diplomatic immunities before the break could keep them. At the, South Depart at, the, at the South Vietnamese Department of Foreign Affairs, the consul had access to the, to, the, to the secretary, to the permanent undersecretary, and to the chief of protocol. But uh, Lombroschini, the, the first consul uh, who, remain, who remained in place, knew that the real power lay in the hands of the military, and he made arrangements should the military order the consulate to close immediately. And for its part, the Quai d'Orsay, the French uh, Department of, of Foreign Affairs, expected the consulate to provide information the political, on the political situation in South Vietnam, as well as to expedite the usual administrative tasks. Thus, in fact, the consul served as a, as a chargé d'affaires. Uh, few actions were, were possible to retaliate. Economic reprisal, 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 sorry, would be uh, uh, would, would not would, would not work, since trade between the two countries was limited, and they would be dangerous uh, 
owing to the amount of French capital invested in South Vietnam. Deporting South Vietnamese living in France would have little political impact since, since these people were mostly students unknown to the general public. At least the kid also wanted the United States to know that it was, what it was not fooled. And so, speaking, speaking on a personal basis, the Under Secretary for Asian Affairs informed the Consular of the American Embassy in Paris of his concern about, I quote, the unpleasant attitude of South Vietnamese authorities toward French interests in their country. Otherwise, French authorities kept silent so as not to compromise the possibility of better relations with the South in the future and for fear of provoking retaliations against French cultural and economic activities in the country. The break implied that several civilian members of the embassy staff, as well as the military attaché, had to leave South Vietnam. The financial attaché and the staff of the consular services, cultural services, and commercial services remain in Saigon. But since uh, the South Vietnamese Department of Foreign Affairs had not mentioned I don't mention the name of the diplomats whom it wanted specifically to leave. The consul was able to, re to retain two secretaries who kept their diplomatic, diplomatic immunities. Conversely, France allowed the South Vietnamese agents in charge of consular, cultural, and economic affairs to remain in Paris. Since the consulate in Saigon had to operate with a reduced workforce, which was saddled with a new task of providing political information, its workload increased significantly. This information was hard to obtain for the ruling cycles avoid telling secrets to the French. Intelligence and public opinion, and public opinion was provided by the French living in South Vietnam, such, such as businessmen or missionaries. French diplomats also kept in touch with the front, but not in Saigon, Contact with the front were established in Cambodia, in plantations near the border with South Vietnam, in Prague, in Algiers, and in Paris, where the front was allowed to open a news bureau in 1967. All told, information was scarce. It was scarce since in 1970, the Department of Foreign Affairs complained, we do not know well contemporary Vietnam. Since uh, the consulate knew that this correct but cold, but cold relations between the two countries resulted from a compromise between tendencies in the junta. It avoided any provocation and kept a low profile. For instance, its additional party for French national, nationals on Bastille Day were rescheduled on the politically neutral New Year's Day. Indeed, South Vietnamese authorities did not lack means to make life difficult for the French. In 1965, they declined all the grants which allowed Vietnamese students to attend French universities, and grants were turned down up to 1968. In 1966, the Saigon Bureau of the French Public Radio and Television Service was forcibly closed. And above all, South Vietnamese authorities could, forbe could forbid French firms to transfer their profits to France. 70% of the profits could be transferred, but the permit had to be re renewed each year. And of course, it was suspended from 1965 on, so that French firms operating in South Vietnam kept lobbying for, reception, for the resumption of diplomatic relations. And in April 1969, under the influence, French Secretary Michel Debré inclined toward resumption of diplomatic relations with South Vietnam, but department specialists uh, dissuaded him from doing so for fear of ruining, ruining relations with uh, North Vietnam. Tensions between uh, South Vietnam and France escalated after the speech delivered by de Gaulle in Phnom Penh in August 1966, which blamed the American war in Vietnam uh, with renewed vigor. Nguyen Dien Cao Ki first considered the possibility of closing immediately all French schools. And then he settled for the arrest of two prominent French businessmen, 
Abel Gox and Philip Grandjean. Philip Grandjean was the director of the Brasserie and Glacier of, uh, of Indochina, the, which provided the, the armies with beer. Uh, uh, both were detained and interrogated for some days by the military police, and then they were released at the request of the American embassy. Guillen Gaokaoki blamed them for having paid taxes with the National Liberation Front to secure their plans against sabotage, but this was probably a pretext since, as Guillen Kaoki well knew, American firms to pay the revolutionary tax. French-speaking schools were not closed on the spot, but South Vietnam plans a gradual extinction. Elementary schools were handed over to Vietnamese authorities at the beginning of the autumn term of 1967, and in secondary schools, all new enrollments uh, were forbidden after 1968. This closure implies a decline of French cultural influence in South Vietnam, since up to that time, the profession had been trained in these schools, and French was taught only as a foreign language in Vietnamese universities. As soon as 1973, English had supplanted French as a main foreign language taught in Vietnamese secondary schools. Even when France took no particular initiative, the competition between Vietnamese politicians often resorted to French bashing. For instance, in February and March 1967, Nguyen Kao Kiu competed with Nguyen Van Thieu for the presidential election set in September, and General Nguyen Ngoc Luan, chief of the military police, organized demonstrations against the consulate. They protested against the creation in Paris of a neutralist provisional government which was supposed to include the front and political exiles. But that was a fake news propagated by Nguyen Ngoc Luan, out of which he made capital to mobilize, it, to mobilize his political base, Catholics and exiled from the north. During the first demonstration, the crowd invaded the building of the consulate. The building was left, was left intact, but two official cars were, were set on fire. The South Vietnamese police reacted only tardily and reluctantly. The US military police, which followed the demonstrators, was not required to intervene, of course, but it remained conspicuously passive, even when the guard of the consulate was beaten. After an official protest uh, by Consul Lombr Lombroschini, the police guarded the consulate during the following de demonstrations. And in the following demonstrations, demonstrators uh, protested not only against France, against France, sorry, but against opponents to the war in the United States. Senator William Fulbright was as much reviled as the goal. Guyen Van Thieu won the presidential election in 1967, and Guyen Kaoki was relegated to the honorific post of vice president. Thieu had to adjust to the progressive withdrawal of the United States from the war, as shown by the opening of the Paris Peace Conference on May 10, 1968. South Vietnam depended far too much on the United States to entertain any idea of breaking with Washington. But in such a context, Saigon looked for new partners which could intercede for it in, in his, uh, on, on his behalf with, in Washington. And among them was France, which was approached during the summer and, uh, of 1968. Uh, Thieu had been cheered by the harsh anti-communist response of the Gaulle, the upheaval in May, June 1968. And so uh, during the summer, Guyen Van Thieu secretly suggested to resume diplomatic relations. In the immediate future, he hoped that France would renege on the authorization given to the, to the Front to open a news bureau in Paris. And, and as a token of goodwill, South Vietnamese students were again allowed to accept French university grants. The consulate un uh, understood the atmos that the atmosphere had changed, and he resumed his annual Bastille Day party in 1968. France did not respond to, to this opening. Its official line, which was maintained up to the peace of 1973, was that as France was host of the Paris peace talks, it had to keep a neutral attitude which forbade any change to the level of relations with conference members as long as the meetings were in session. <laughs> 
This position, according to the French Department of Foreign Affairs, was perfectly consistent with the opening of the news bureau of the National Liberation Front in Paris, for this news bureau would be deprived of diplomatic status, and its creation had been approved in 1967, before the opening of the conference, and besides, its existence would facilitate contacts with a party to the conference. Besides, since French diplomats were unsure whether South Vietnam would be able to, to withstand the test of time, they did not want to be overtly compromised with, with the Saigon regime and to severe relations with the front. And since the responsibility of the break lay with, uh, with uh, South Vietnam, France agreed to improve economic and cultural con uh, relations, but let Saigon take the initiative. South Vietnam brought more pressure to bear in 1969. In April, Nguyen Van Thieu publicly announced that he was ready to resume relations with Cambodia and with France. In October, uh, South Vietnam accepted French university grants. Uh, uh, France Vietnam extended by half the time allowed to French lessons in certain primary schools. It allowed French firms to transfer out of Vietnam their profit for the year 1968. It, and most importantly, uh, South Vietnam rescinded its decree of 1964, which banned a number of French goods from South, uh, from, from South Vietnam. Consul Giovanni Grandi pleaded with the with French Department of Foreign Affairs that now that the atmosphere was cleared, France should, pay, France should pave the way to side with the South Vietnamese authorities after the war, not with the North, for French interests were concentrated in the South. Giovanni Grandi admitted that the Saigon regime remained unstable and unartificial, but he was voicing the concerns of French economic interests in South Vietnam. The new uh, Undersecretary for Asian Affairs in Paris, Henri Fremont Maurice, opposed such a move, for it was still impossible to know whether the Republic of Vietnam or the National Front would govern Saigon after the war. Thus, France did not have to choose between the North and the South, but it had to defend its interests in the South, taking care only not to alleviate, not to alienate, sorry, any of the contending parties. Accordingly, France welcomed the fresh start of economic and cultural relations with South Vietnam, but France stopped short of political relations. Any move suggesting that France officially acknowledged the, Sa the Saigon regime or representative of the local population would have to be avoided. But of course, that was not good enough to satisfy uh, the Republic of Vietnam. When former Maurice visited Saigon during a tour of, of East Asia, the Council of the Foreign Affairs Department let him know that owing to the persistence of political disagreements, it remained difficult to start genuine, genuine negotiations with France, and that Paris was suspected to back the candidature of Duan Vang Minh for the presidential election of October 1971. So, the South Vietnamese had bet that some gesture of goodwill would suffice to induce France to resume diplomatic relations, and they had been proved wrong. They soon reverted to cold relations, all the more as military temporary successes led them, led them to believe that victory was within reach. For instance, during the spring of 1970, when American and South Vietnamese armies intervened in Cambodia, the Vietnamese shelled French-owned plantations in Cambodia and Western South Vietnam. The consulate pro uh, protested, but to no avail, it was told to complain against Cambodia. But the retreat of Vietnamese armies from Cambodia at the end of June 1970, under the pressure of the US peace movement, humbled the uh, Vietnam Vietnamese authorities. And since the measure which affected specifically French interests had been abrogated, an imperfect but bearable equilibrium from them on characterized relations between Paris and, uh, and Saigon. During uh, his assignment as consul in Saigon from July 1970 to May 1973, Jacques de Follin was able to meet frequent, frequently with military commanders, with our civil servants, with American ambassador Eskol Bunker, with the U.S. Commander-in-Chief, Katrina Brahms, and even with Duong Van Minh. 
but he took care never to meet a member of the front or with success of the provisional revolutionary government, PRG. He knew that South Vietnamese authorities would never have tolerated such a move. The anti-communism, which is a very common feature of uh, French ruling elites and French diplomats, also contributed to ease relations between Paris and Saigon. Uh, Georges Pompidou, who presided over uh, France from 1969 to 1974, he died in function. Pompidou was a Gaullist, but he was not regarded as fully legitimate by certain member of his, uh, some members of his Gaullist party, for he had not been a member of the resistance or the Free French during the World War II. Pompidou was also keen to ease the bridge with the United States. And Vietnam, which had caused some of, of the most violent, violent clashes between De Gaulle and Washington, provided him with opportunities to assert himself uh, with both audiences, the Gaullists and, uh, and the United States. Pompidou made it a point to, to display his coldness towards the provisional revolutionary government. As soon as December 1971, from Maurice, donc the Under Secretary for East Asian Affairs, uh, listed the advantages of a resumption of diplomatic relations with South Vietnam without mentioning the provisional revolutionary government. Uh, I quote, I, I translated the, uh, his, um, his scribbling in English. The strengthening of South Vietnam is a fact. Elections, pacification, Vietnamization. There is a strong possibility that South Vietnam may survive. Military conquest by the North or socialization may be discounted. Resumption will make it easier for us to keep the South eating from the North, to protect French interests, generally to make the most of our, of our, our political, economic, and, and cultural influence in Vietnam, and to contribute to post-war reconstruction. By June 72, the section of the French Foreign, uh, of the French Foreign Office dealing with Asia felt that relations between France and South Vietnam were warming. Accordingly, when France, when peace, sorry, returned to Vietnam, France resumed diplomatic relations with, with South Vietnam. France raised the status of its mission in Hanoi from full consulate to embassy, but France conspicuously abstain from establishing diplomatic relations with the provisional uh, revolutionary government. And this position was questionable in law, since France was a, warranty, was, a, was a warranting power of the ceasefire in Vietnam, which explicitly mentioned the two South Vietnamese parties. Pompidou himself had decided to snub the, the, the provisional revolutionary, uh, revolutionary government. Foreign Secretary Maurice Schumann had advised him to raise the provisional revolutionary government news bureau in Paris to the status of delegation without any reciprocal, reciprocal, reciprocal representation of France to the PRJ. But Pompidou resisted even this harsh measure. It was only in 1974, after the death of Pompidou, that France allowed the PRJ to establish a modest permanent mission in Paris. And yet, South Vietnamese authorities deemed the French position unsatisfactory. For, uh, uh, for Saigon denied any legitimacy to the PRG. The Republic of Vietnam had tried to link the resumption of diplomatic relations with France to a French declaration recognizing that the Saigon regime was the only legitimate power in the South, as the United States has done. And once again, uh, the Republic of Vietnam has, has asked for too much. And once again, it, had, it, made, it maintained a cool, a cool attitude toward France because it was disappointed. One year after the resumption of, of diplomatic relations, the French ambassador to Saigon, Jean-Marie Mérillon, had to admit the persistence of distrust, of distrust toward French policy. He also noticed that although a majority of the South Vietnamese elite were still fluent in French, young people under 30 were less eager to learn the language, that the sales of French books had fallen abys abysmally, that French economic interests in South Vietnam were concentrated in declining activities such as rubber plantations, 
and that French technology was now seriously challenged by American and Japanese competitors, for instance, in the field of mechanical engineering, of medical engineering, sorry. So the conclusion is clear. The break of diplomatic relations did not cause any real harm to the staff of the French consulate in Saigon. The agents just had to work extra hours to adopt it to cuts in the workforce. But they failed to maintain French economic and cultural position in South Vietnam, as they were required to do. The French government, uh, the Vietnamese government, the governing circles were eager to break with all remnants of the colonial past, as shown, as shown by the Vietnamization of the schooling system. The enormous American economic aid reorganized trade links away from France. The war discouraged new economic ventures. Political differences between the two states remain basic. All in all, the concert has been assigned an, an unmanageable task. Thank you. Uh, France had no real economic interests in North Vietnam because of yeah. the communization. And its only real economic interests were in South Vietnam. Yeah, because of communization and because of the United States who managed to put all French firms remaining in North Vietnam on a blacklist immediately immediate after Geneva. So, so they, 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 everybody fled. Everybody fled. Everybody fled. <laughs> um, in the policy process um, in France, if there were no economic interests um, concerned with North Vietnam, why were the economic interests on um, South Vietnam relatively weak in influencing policy compared to um, that? I mean, that's not, that's not the same. Simply to say that usually economic interests have some influence on government policy. Because France considered itself a world power. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Something similar to that. But really, that, 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 it's not. So the economic interests in this case uh, were well, not significant enough. It was, yeah, it was obviously too, because of France wanted to, to, remain, to, to regain political influence in Indochina. And that way, uh, and, and, and so for that reason, it's, it's ties to North Vietnam, what willingness to be. Well, you know, the goal is, the goal is plan was uh, to bring peace to Indochina. The, the, import, uh, the, the, the model was the second Geneva conference about Laos, which was, the, the French idea was to extend that to all of Indochina. Of course, that was not the American idea at all. Uh, and uh, that's the uh, old French policy under the goal. Uh, so economic, uh, e e economic uh, consideration become important uh, under Pompidou when peace become, uh, near, uh, becomes near. Then, of course, traditional interests are more, are more important, and Pompidou was at a, at a less exalted uh, notion of French position in the world at the goal, of course. Did, did the uh, uh, South Vietnam, after the, the fall of Saigon, did France's economic interests uh, end, or did it try to preserve them? Mm, I don't really know, actually, but it, it becomes a really a, a, a regional question. It's, not, it's no longer a question of of, uh, of, uh, of re real policy. What, 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 the only thing, the thing that uh, they were remaining weak, as you, as I said, in the end, they were uh, they were uh, con uh, there was. Um, competition from the from the US from Japan and so on uh, the the important thing that France tried to do uh, in 1965 was to broker a peace uh, a last a last minute peace between north and south it was a complete failure and uh, no there are still economic interests but uh, it's it's marginal I would say in fact, I was wondering, um, it, the South Vietnamese didn't try to attack. Uh, you, you mentioned, for example, the banks and all that, that the French had big interests in the banks. And all. If they were, they didn't try to minimize or... Oh, yes, as, 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 um, as I said, they tried to nationalize a lot. Uh, and uh, they did not nationalize, uh, the nationalization took place uh, immediately after the peace, in, in the end, of the, in the second part of the 50s. Uh, 
because they, they were nationalists, they wanted to be their own masters and so on. Uh, they were anti-communist masters, let's say. I know Zien did, I mean, during this period of Do, uh, in relations, uh, I was just wondering. Well, well what, what, as we see, what, what they did, they, they, they had, they had a, a legal means to attack French interests, which was to, to forbid the uh, 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 French profits to to move from Vietnam, and that, that was it. That was that, and that was enough to squeeze uh, French companies. <laughs> and Michelin, did they go after Michelin at all? I mean, that was must have been the. Well, they, they, had, they had no money to nationalize the plantations. Yeah. That, that was the I problem. Michelin, mm. so. And the plantations uh, suffered a lot because, of course, uh, that was the, the guerrilla. Uh, uh, operated. That, that was the first thing to do uh, if you wanted to break the economy. Yeah, yeah I've seen some, I was saying uh, earlier to Sean that I've seen some documents at Nantes, at the mm -hmm. diplomatic archives in Nantes, where uh, there are actually uh, reports from uh, a lot of these uh, rubber plantations yeah. where they're talking about the tax by the uh, NLF and some of them being held yeah. captive. Yeah, well, there were agreements by, by, by plantation, by, between the plantation owners and the NLF to, to limit the, the attacks, of course. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you, but all, all, all firms did that. Yeah, but after the break, <laughs> yes. uh, relations, they didn't try to attack the interests? Uh, well, as I said, uh, the... Um, there were um, attacks during uh, the com invasion of Cambodia in 1970, but uh, as you, obviously, uh, what, what I, uh, the, the South Vietnamese did not want a sort of war with France. They wanted to. Uh, the break was mostly a matter of internal uh, of internal po uh, politics, politics rather than policy. Poli and uh, and uh, soon, of course, after three years, they, they wanted to. Uh, as soon as sixty eight, after three years of, of uh, they want they want to mend relations because they they are beginning to, to realize that they are going to be let off. So there is no need to. Uh, to to harm too much French interests. Um, this is a bit beyond what you're working on, but I'm curious to what extent you feel um, French observers in Vietnam and the French government during this time thought South Vietnam might maintain its existence longer. Uh, it's difficult to know from um, from from the from the um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Obviously, they 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 hope for it, for it, for for it to to last because they want anti communist for pure and simple. But they did not know how long. You see, in seventy one, they they see all right, Vietnamization is it seems to be working and so on. So. Uh, and what, what, there was one uh, after the peace. There was one important uh, mission by uh, François Misoff, uh, uh, a Gaullist uh, ex-minister, uh, was uh, was a representative at the time. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, a mission uh, you know, of information to, to advise uh, the government what to do in Indochina after the war. And uh, the mission was, uh, it was under Pompidou, the mission was really uh, put all the money on the south. Uh, uh, if, you, if you read the, pa the papers, uh, it's, it's funny, after 1973, uh, in the French, uh, if you, in, in the French Department of Foreign Affairs, you have the impression that North Vietnam is the enemy. <laughs> it's incredible. <laughs> But the reason, the designated enemy, it's, it's because uh, they are, it's, 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 it's made by people like Fromont Maurice, uh, who had made his uh, career uh, mostly in Europe, and he finished as ambassador to, uh, in, in, uh, in West Germany. Uh, when they, at, the, at the time, there were two Germanies, and uh, he, was, uh, he, was, he was an atlanticist. And, uh, they, and uh, they could not depart from the idea that behind North Vietnam, there was a U.S. Soviet <laughs> Union. <laughs> I've seen that in uh, documents from the Hanoi Council Consulate too, uh, especially in the late fifties. The consul, the French consul in uh, Hanoi, keeps referring to the DRV government as the enemy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, but of course, all this is for after the peace, before France had to be able to. Uh, 
to, I would not say to broker the peace because the, the input of France was, was minimum, but to, to, it was important for, for, for France that, 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 that the conference was a success. It was absolutely necessary. <laughs> I, I wonder, thank you, this was really informative. Uh, I wonder, were domestic politics in France a factor at all in how France yeah. approached it? Yeah, uh, N not really, because South Vietnam has very few uh, uh, very few champions in France, and they were mostly re really, really on the right. Uh, uh, it would be uh, the, the constituents of South Vietnam in France during this period would be what uh, the um, uh, the backers of Eric Zemmour, Zemmour today are. That is a constituency going from the uh, the the far uh, the right of the right to the far right, <laughs> but the goalies were were not, of course, uh, uh, and uh, and the left was not indeed. Uh, on the contrary, uh, uh, the, the uh, North Vietnam was loved by the population interested in politics in, in majority in majority in front at the time. And is there a sense that the attacks against the French consulate changed public opinion in France at all, or was this not quite? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, frankly, few people, ex except from uh, people who were interested for business or cultural reasons, who were, few people cared about Indochina, uh, as few people ever cared for Indochina in French history. <laughs> I was just wondering, do you think there's any link? Because I mean, a lot of this policy begins after the Algerian War ends. Uh, do you think that there could be any kind of uh, link uh, between uh, the two? That in for for the well, whole, I mean, it's uh, it has any. Link? Uh... What, what you can say is that, uh, you, you know, there are several, uh, several phases in, Go, in, Gaulish, French, French, in Gaulish policy. French is, is, is a super Atlantist uh, with the idea of the, uh, my new paper on the, uh, uh, the, the three powers of French, uh, France, Go, Go, Britain and, and the US ruling the world. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, uh, there, uh, since it has been rejected, there, there is the idea of extend of, uh, re remaining uh, uh, an Asian power with with uh, the Laos conference, the Laos conference of Geneva, second Geneva, Geneva conference, which is the, the template of, of all foreign policy in the region. And after being freed of Algeria, he began his uh, third worldism. Let's say so. What and um, what will end, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the first uh, um, uh, the first example of this new policy is the recognition of, of China. Mm -hmm. But uh, Vietnam is only a part of the puzzle. Um, Dr. Henrik Kwan completed his doctorate in social anthropology at Cambridge University. He is now senior research fellow in social sciences, Trinity College, Cambridge as well as a member of the Mega Asia Research Group at Seoul National University Asia Center. Dr. Kwan is the author of four monographs. His first book, After the Massacre, Commemoration and Consolation in Ha, Me, and Me Lai, was published by the University of California Press in 2006 and was translated into Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. His second monograph, Ghosts of War in Vietnam, was published by Cambridge University Press and then translated into French. Coming up. Coming up. No, no, coming up. And his most recent book, After the Korean War, An Intimate History, was published in 2020 as part of the Cambridge University Press Social and Cultural History of Modern Warfare series. He is currently at work on his fifth book, American Power in Korean Religion, the Fordham University Press. It's now, coming out too. Yeah, it's coming yeah. out too. Right. Okay. It seems the coronavirus pandemic created a lot Nothing of Nothing else to do, yes. No. Okay. Now, Dr. Kwan will present his paper, Experiencing the Korean War. Dr. Kwan, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, bonjour à tous. Um, yeah, now it's Korean War. Um, I consider myself as also a student of uh, Vietnam War. Uh, that was some time ago, but I still have that thing in my mind. 
And um, one book I wrote in 2010, in between Vietnam War and Korean War, it's called The Other Cold War. It was something like a conceptual history of the Cold War, and in which Vietnam and Korea appear side by side. Um, in a way, as part of a critique of the notion of the concept of the Cold War, that is fairly familiar. We, over the lunch, we had an interesting talk about how Cold War history is almost like a prehistoric history for many young students these days. And um, it's not easy to talk about Cold War. It's easier to talk about Second World War, First World War. Um, so the, um, uh, I'm not, what, I'm not, I'm not getting, I'm not going to get into uh, what I think of how to think of Cold War in this talk, but it's, if we put Vietnam and Indochina and Korean Peninsula together, just to note that the concept of the Cold War that is familiar to European historians becomes uh, slightly problematic because it was not really Cold War as such or imaginary war or the long peace. All these notions are very familiar to international historians or diplomatic historians. And um, I'm, I'm by trade an anthropologist, and so we are, we are known to see things from ground up, if you like, but, uh, but, but engaging with the large historical events such as the uh, Second Indochina War or the Korean War, 1950 and 53, um, I had to read loads of books on you know, international relations and international history, not to mention um, um, literature on violence and uh, modern warfare. So the, my work is uh, reasonably eclectic. And today, um, I understand my role in this stimulating workshop is to make the transition from Vietnam War to Korean War. So that uh, I will try to do. And uh, my previous speaker, Laurent, spoke about the triangle, triangular relationship between, I mean, if you like, from colonial history to Cold War history, and the actors change, you know, change hands from uh, France as such to the United States, whereas Vietnam stays put, where many, thing ha many things happen in Vietnam. And one thing that is, um, that we have to come to terms is, uh, as I said, uh, Viet the Vietnam War and the Koreans experience civil come international war in the form of uh, um, what we call Korean War from 1950 to 1953, uh, so three years. Whereas Vietnamese, if we like, from 1945 to 1975, they underwent this uh, large scale turbulence for 30 years, 10 times. Um, so I will later on introduce um, what I think, what I learned from my work in Vietnam about Cold War is the, um, is what um, the people in Guangnam province um, refer to, in my understanding, the experience of Cold War is a pseudo, is, um, I'll get into this metaphor, historical metaphor in due time. Um, but the, the Vietnam and Korea have loads of connections and some crucial differences. One crucial difference is the, um, they, they experience partitions and they experience a large scale civil war, as, it, as I said. But at the same time, the colonial experience was rather different. The Vietnam was colonized by European power. Uh, although it experienced a brief period of occupation, military occupation by Asia's imperial power, which is Japan, and it was a very difficult experience. And, and then that history didn't come out yet, but it's, it's an important history. Whereas uh, the Korean Peninsula, the history, the experience of Korea is um, of colonial experience is rather unique among Asian nations. Oh, uh, the, the fact that it was colonized by the 
you know, late coming um, Asian empire rather than traditional European powers. Um, and then Laurent did mention the, the way in which the um, French economic interests in Indochina uh, struggle through after the independence of um, uh, um, uh, after, after the end of the first Indochina War, 1954. And then that episode in the literature I, I consumed has a lot to do with the changing parameters of uh, American foreign policy in Asia Pacific or in, you know, it defined in larger terms, East Asia, inclusive of Southeast Asia at the time, at the center of which lies the fate of Japan. So the the uh, the I um, part of this group that uh, considers uh, Asia's Cold War experience from different perspective. Like if we see Asia's Cold War from Japan, how 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 the would it look, or from Vietnam or Korea? So the the Japan, although I'm not going to get much into it, it's. Uh, we can't, uh, the, if we put Japan into, uh, into the foreground of Asia's Cold War picture, Vietnam and Korea get further connections, right? Okay, the, but, um, but I'll, I'll stick to uh, my familiar gun of ground up. And then the, the title of this talk is Experiencing the Korean War. And that notion of experience is mostly referring to how ordinary people uh, experienced the uh, crisis of 1950 to 1953. And um, um, one thing that I didn't mention, which uh, constitutes the uh, bulk of my first book is the Vietnam War was um, international war in the sense that it involved not only the uh, the American power, but also Japanese economic power, as well as South Korea's heavy involvement uh, in military forms. And there is growing evidence how North Korea got involved in the Vietnam War, and that's another question. Right. Okay. The, this is um, um, this um, demilitarized zone that divides, continues to divide. Um, uh, the Korean Peninsula into two uh, separate um, uh, political forms and societies. And this is what was entrenched in the peninsula in July 1953. But mind you that the, uh, the peninsula was already divided into two separate uh, political societies in um, August 1945, immediately after the end of Pacific War through the occupation, military occupation, separate military occupation by Soviet power in the north and the uh, American power in the south. So the history of partition is very clear cut in Korean Peninsula. It's, it's uh, less complicated. It's from 1945 onwards up, up till now. And um, the, the this paper was originally delivered to uh, actually the um, Swiss Culture Center in Paris uh, some weeks ago. And then they asked me whether I can um, uh, bring the Korean War history into um, um, more squarely into European history. Uh, rather than um, Asia Pacific history, etc. And uh, in that trajectory, uh, tomorrow um, there will be a talk about Sweden. And Sweden played a quite interesting role in the Second Indochina War, but it also played in the, a certain role in Korea together with Switzerland. So I start with the um, the um, the, the concept of neutrality that is, is, is that goes part with that goes hand in hand with this uh, 
um, partition line between north and south. So this this is this is what uh, often appears in uh, public media each time there is a problem between north and south and in terms of rapprochement between the two um, two countries or oh, there is a good news always happens this place it's it's uh, it's um, it's managed jointly by north korean forces and south and come american forces but formally uh, it is a territory of neutral nations commission it's switzerland sweden poland and czechoslovakia in old days in poland and czechoslovakia um did sign off some time ago after the end of the cold war in the beginning of 1990s but sweden and switzerland continue to play an uh, important role and um the the koreans are kind of hitting in paris as well in, in with the, the, this particularly the southern koreans with the interesting stimulating cultural product and one of um, very well known um, film is the uh, it has this Panmunjom as as the principal background of his story. It's called the JSA Joint Security Area um, that came out in two thousand. And basically, the story is you know this uh, the the chap in the foreground and the other one uh, the center in the background. Um, the, the one in, at the center is an officer from North Korean Sentinel of Joint Security Area, whereas um, um, the chap with uh, the helmet of military police is the conscript of South Korean Army. And the story is long, but it's um, but they develop secretive friendship. You know, they pay visit to each other across the what was not supposed to be cross, and then something goes wrong, and there is a gun, gun shooting, and there is a tragic ending. Um, so this lady in, be, uh, in between the two, she is um, supposed to be. Uh, it's a long story again. Why does she look age, look like an Asian if she is a Swiss officer? Anyway, she comes uh to the demilitarized zone to investigate the incident of shooting and uh, so at the end of a long story is uh, the film is about the international concept of neutrality right the judiciary or political notion of neutrality which gives you right not to take side right to be objective and neutral uh, in this ideologically polarized environment and so uh, the lady is committed to this notion of legal notion of neutrality right and objectivity as well whereas these two gentlemen uh, from north and south um, they are heartbroken and then uh, to the end of the film the major john her name is uh, does interview in pyongyang with the north korean officer and as a favorable remark, the officer uh, tells uh, says to Major John, uh, "It's good that you pursue this, um, you know, honorable uh, task, but there is no place for neutrality in this land." So, the, the, the film magnifies the idea of neutrality seen from a bird eye view. You know, the, what to do with the space, and uh, we are beyond this. You know. Uh, um, this politics of, um, you know, reciprocal or mutual enmity, whereas from ground up, um, people do uh, encounter certain uh, limited space of enmity, but at the end of uh, at the end of the day, this um, the relationship of enmity is illusion, and there is no no place for such a human life in this part of the world. So that's the that's a, that's that's the storyline, and um, Korean War. <clears throat> um, is an important event in 20th century global history. Um, I grew up 
I, I spent all my elementary to secondary school education next to this base is Camp Walker in, in a city, provincial city called Tegu. And then uh, my, my parents' house was next to another military base called Camp Henry. So I grew up next to Camp Henry. I went to school next to Camp Walker for 12 years. So the presence of mili American, American army is just a given thing, you know, it's the everyday life is uh, taken for granted. But you never question why they are here. Uh, the, around the bases, there were interesting things, uh, apart from what kids of my age at that time were not supposed to see, you know, kind of between in, in terms of um, in terms of American servicemen and Korean Korean women who were uh, very much around the base. But apart from that, there were uh, rows of really interesting antique shops because servicemen liked the traditional objects and then. I used to spend hours instead of going to school and studying how and studying these objects near the American bases. But the, it is an established view um, among scholars of diplomatic history, international history, that the United States um, became um, a major military power. I think we can use the uh, alternative expression of military empire through the event of Korean War rather than Second World War. And, um, and I have a, a few quotations that justifies this statement, like, um, you know, the, um, um, uh, the how, how, how centrally the event of the Korean War uh, contributed to uh, the um, transformation of American politics and society into a form that is very familiar to uh, to us in the second half of 20th century and which continues today. And the the scholars of Chinese history, right? Um, China's modern political history, there are, uh, there are a growing number of scholars who argue that China, as a pursuit of great power status, began with the Korean War too. So that, that touches upon the fact that in, instead of, in place of USSR, China militarily took part in the Korean War. So if you, so let's say that from June 1952, Till July 1953, uh, it, compared to Vietnam War, is a very short span of time, but many things happen. So by October, by the end of October 1950, so three months into the war, or four months into the war, the the Korean War uh, is it was no longer a civil war between post-colonial national state power in the north and the equivalent in the southern half of peninsula. So it, it was losing its character as a civil war and it was becoming an international war, uh, principally between United States and China. So the, so the I, years ago, I, I was working for um, um, the um, Korean armies um, the, the MIA uh, activities, uh, being a, I'm, I'm, I'm not a forensic anthropologist, but I had to learn part of archaeology and biological anthropology, so I, I can deal with forensic anthropology. But the, uh, so we were working on the hillsides where um, the Eurasian bonds and Asiatic bonds are mixed up together and so it, literally there are battlefields where um, this, um, this um, international war between the today's two major powers took place. So shortly, in short, the Korean War was a civil war between, two, like in Vietnam, between two separate polities, but at the same time, it was an international war uh, between 
uh, two major powers that constitute the world order today. And the, this, the theater of the Korean War is a single space in modern history where young men from the United States and not so young men, because there were many of them were former Kuomintang soldiers from China, uh, took each other's life. And, and we don't know what to do with the history, you know, whether it will uh, blow out of proportion in the future, right? And how to contain this history and memory, um, and how to contain or remember this episode uh, creatively so that uh, it works for uh, it works for peace rather than another round of uh, international conflict in this part of the world. It's a major question that those of us, including myself, are very much involved in how to remember Korea more creatively, right? But the the reality today is rather cruel because the. Um, the narrative of Korean War is fast becoming uh, that of international war between China and United States. This is new film, mega box, mega mega box hit film from China. Um, I don't I don't know. I I I I I, I keep losing the number of viewers. You know, it's forty million, sometimes more than that. Anyway, this. Um, this is this is um, this is based on um, on an event uh, of a Korean War, uh, in which China claims that it 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 um, it really beat the, the the spirit of this American Empire in in a single battle, and so and the this is. Um, uh, it's a it's, it's a graveyard of um, former uh, Chinese volunteer soldiers <clears throat> about 40 kilometers northwest of Pyongyang, where um, uh, Chinese soldiers are buried, and um, and uh, and the most prominent grave of this place is that of Mao Anning, the Mao Zedong's eldest son who was one of the first casualties of Chinese volunteer army by South African uh, fighter jet and napalm. And so this, the, and these in North Korea, Pyongyang is, it's, it, 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 it depending on how, how things change in, it, uh, in its relationship with the United States on the one hand and um, China on the other, um, this, uh, a grave of um, Chinese martyrs of uh, the uh, Korean War uh, gets really serious public attention in in that part of the world, right? So, in short, the Korean, the Korean War, like Vietnam War, was not a single war that I approach in I approach both wars in different terms. But Korean War was, of course, a civil war between two post-colonial forces, who uh, each of which through, uh, by uh, violent means, tried to bring the post-colonial society into the fold of one single nation state, right? In exclusion of the other forces. So in that sense, the Vietnam War and the Korean War share a certain character. And um, China was part of Vietnam War in some ways, in, in major ways, and uh, it was more so in the Korean conflict. And then the, and the United States was present in both uh, theaters, so it shares that character. So the civil war and international war, and if we put Vietnam and Korea together, um, these two events become a major uh, episode of Asia's Cold War experience, which, as I said uh, earlier, alluded to earlier, um, make, can make the concept of the Cold War slightly uh, unstable as uh, than before. Right, so th three dimensions of um, three facets of Korean War, civil war, international war, 
and global conflict that we call the Cold War, and it was a major, uh, major episode. And then, and I, I push a little bit further, and how the Korean War, together with the first in the China War, became the um, the platform, if you like, or major agent, major force uh, for the rise of another another world that became very familiar in the 20th century. So I spoke about the transformation of major power in the first world, uh, in the first world, liberal world. The United States became the military empire through this event. And then the second world, the second world, socialist international world, um, uh, started radically changing itself. Some call it like, rather than having a one son, the uh, second world after the Korean War started having two sons, like Soviet and Chinese powers. And then, uh, and then we, as we all know that this aspect of the Korean War related chain transformation of uh, international socialism led to the Sino-Soviet split. Um, starting immediately after the Korean War, actually, in 1955, but we trace it like the 56, 57, as you like it. And there was another world that emerged from the first in the China War and Korean War together is the third world. Among many things, uh, if, we, if we shift our attention from someone like Sukarno, Nehru, Nase to less major but equally important figures such as Unu of uh, uh, today's Myanmar at the time it was Burma is a, a gentleman right in the middle and then Unu's biography and the new diplomatic you know kind of literature on because Myanmar is hot you know in Asia and a new um, work on uh, Unu's career shows clearly that for him, the, the 1955 Fan Bandung meeting, what became the platform for the non-aligned movement and the origin of the third world, if you like, as a political concept, was nothing but his observation, his observation of Indochina and Korea. So small nations like small powers like Myanmar, Burma, which was already in a state of civil war, a very complex civil war at the time. How do we avoid the, the forces of international politics, the bipolarizing forces of international politics, seeping into our domestic arena and shaping our life, determining our life, how to avoid that? And we are small, so we have to get together and bring our forces together and create another force in order to safeguard our self-determination and sovereignty and basically, for him, the, the third world movement was to avoid the fate of Indochina and Korea for other nations in Asia and Africa, right? Newly independent nations. So in some ways, in some ways we can push the, the world historical relevance of 1950 and 1953 war. And in many cases, such as for UNO, the Korea doesn't exist alone, it exists together with in the China, right? And so for uh, leaders like UNU, is um, Korea and Indochina was so tragic, that he called it Holocaust of War of Indochina and Korea, and how the nation of Burma would escape the fate of Indochina and Korea is the imperative, is the, the most important question for us in mid 1950s. And that became his dedication to the Bandung meeting, right? And um, I spoke to uh, a few colleagues uh, during the lunch briefly about this. And um, as I briefly mentioned earlier on in relation to Laurent's paper and how the, uh, the um, <clears throat> Japan became uh, what Japan is today through the Korean War, 
And this is a long story. I'm not going to get into that. But but it's, uh, it's during the um, the major event in East Asia or broad Asia Pacific or in today's term Indo Pacific, if you like, as you like it. But the the original shape of this geopolitical space um, at the center of which was the fate of Japan after uh, 1945. But the the we we the outbreak of war in Korean Peninsula in immediate neighborhood, um, how the U.S. policy to Asia Pacific uh, uh, start changing radically from one form of, um, if you like, democratic internationalism or liberal internationalism into something different. I mean, I think in France at the time, I mean, I think I, I read in Jacques Derrida's work or something like that. He said um, how the um, how around this time the the French politics was also changing. You know, because this uh, uh, shifting from the uh, accounting for the experience of um, 1939 to 1945 to something else. You know, to, to the ideology of anti-communism, which was a very practical notion friend for French Republic at the time. But the, the in, uh, in broad East Asian terrain, how the, um, uh, the uh, um, um, <clears throat> transformation of Japan to uh, most principal bulwark against international communism, which includes not only major powers in international uh, socialism such as USSR or China, but also third world revolutions in uh, Southeast Asia, how Japan became a major front line in US global strategy. And uh, as my colleague uh, uh, Mazuda Hajimu, who is writing his second book on the transformation of Japanese society itself during, uh, during the Korean War and immediately afterwards, um, and something something akin to an American, you know, purge of American activities uh, um, was sweeping across Japanese public world, not merely in the United States or places like the Philippines and elsewhere in other uh, Asian countries. So, in some ways, um, these are coming out. And um, in some ways, also the, these stories, like four dimensions of Korean War already, like a civil war, international war, and a major episode of early Cold War, as well as this, the transformation of East Asia as such, you know, the rise of Japan. We are not talking about rise of China. The rise of China is something else, the rise of Japan. Um, uh, in, the, in the broad Asia Pacific. And as a growing scholarship, uh, I, I, I include myself in this growing scholarship. Um, it's another dimension, in addition to civil, international, and global dimensions, is the societal dimensions. Is uh, not since the since the end of like say like 1990s uh, for the past 20 years uh, growing evidence growing new evidence is coming out as to uh what korean war was for ordinary koreans uh in addition in in addition to all you know other dimensions other meanings of this war uh in international terrain and then i is the, um, a number of new studies on this matter define the Korean War principally as a war against society. It's just colossal, okay, incessant, just um, assault by state powers against um, ordinary people, if you like, and all society as such. Um, the in this uh, in this sphere, which was um, relatively unknown, apart from uh, what people talk about informally among themselves, like during the ancestor worship, or during the commemorative rituals, 
you know, uh, people do uh, on behalf of the missing and tragically killed during the conflict, or uh, people who became separated between northern and southern parts who haven't seen each other for bloody 70 years, you know, husbands and wives and children, and their parents. And then some people do, you know, because it's 70 years, they must have, they must be no longer in this world. So, you know, the anxiety whether we should uh, do ancestral rituals or not for there's some missing people. So it's, a, it's, a kind, of, it's a kind of anxieties and concerns that are part of everyday life, right? Uh, for a vast number of people. And for, um, so this um, lived experience of Korean War and then uh, the meaning of the Korean War in the realm of this experience is relatively new. So, uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, this, uh, this research became possible, um, many oral testimonies and new materials, um, diaries uh, came out to uh, show how uh, Korean War for the Koreans was something akin to the, you know, kind of collapse of the heavens. You know, this, you don't know what it is, but it's, uh, there is absolutely no morality, no normativity, and um, it's, 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 a, it's a pure violence in itself. P it exertion, a coercion of state power um, in, in its pure form. And so there is a historian who lived through the uh, occupation of Seoul uh, by Northern armies and um, at the outset of the Korean War, he wrote in his diary, uh, his name is Kim Song Chil. Um, uh, he wrote in his diary, among many things, uh, how impossible it is to play the business of citizenship in this land. Meaning that citizens, if you want to become a, a meaningful citizen uh, for one political society in this condition of uh, uh, political bifurcation, you become abject persons in view of the other state power. So when the waves of violence come first from the north and from the south, back again and again, and which uh, what kind of citizen do I do I have to become? Uh, or can I be a citizen of a political society at all? Because if you become a meaningful citizen of one political society, your life is uh, disposable from the perspective of the other. And this is where the Vietnamese, this powerful idiom of uh, Vietnamese idiom of soido comes in. The Koreans do have their own metaphors, but not as powerful as Vietnamese because they underwent for so many years. So, you know, is a, it's a central Vietnamese kind of ceremonial food made of sticky rice, white, and black beans. It's quite delicious. It don't, it, it's not that enticing. It may not be that, but it's damn good. I, I recommend you try. But it's with, especially with the peanuts. Uh, it's really good. But the, uh, People in Gwangai and Gwangnam region use this as a, as a metaphor, historical metaphor. It's basically what it is, is at night, a, you know, certain group of people who, who, you know, ununiformed people come and claim the sovereignty over the village space. And during the day, uniformed different people, the same Vietnamese, with a few foreigners from time to time, Koreans and Americans too, uh, come and claim this space belongs to them. So how do you how do you how do you live in this world um, that changes in political terms as often as a night and day? So soido, when you eat soido, you have to ingest, you have to eat the white and black part together. It, it's it's inconceivable to separate the two things. Uh, and so in the same line, living in, in this uh, history of the Cold War, political bipolarity in this part of the world is to eat, literally eat both the night and day part of the political reality. You can't separate the two. So this, um, I introduced this 
and then the back to so this what I'm saying is uh, as uh, Unu Obama understood the Holocaust of war in Indochina and Korea, despite many differences, had one central similitude. Uh, if we get into the experience of ordinary people, especially in rural areas, um, they have much in common and much to talk to each other common. And um, so uh, the, I will uh, skip this part on uh, how, how, to, how to conceptualize the last dimension of Korean War, which was uh, violence against society. Um, maybe I'll skip it, but it's uh, this one um, couple uh, it's from uh, the, the, the couple uh, from Tegu, my, where I uh, spent my childhood. And the gentleman was an um, anti colonial activist. And as is the case in Asian societies, anti colonialism, um, anti colonial activists um, after the Russian Revolution had element of uh, progressivism, you know. Like, in the wide world, is the only power that supports the anti-colonial movement was the Russian power. So the, he was a member of a youth uh, communist youth movement, and etc. So the, when the, the the South Korean forces were running away from the encroaching uh, northern forces, the state of South Korea round up nearly 200,000 souls uh, with a pretext, pretext of preemptive violence. These were you know, like dangerous folks, then dangerous people, right, five minutes. And then um, the, the gentleman was away from home when the military po police came to his place. So they took his wife away. So he became an uh, activist uh, in post war years, you know, in love for her that in order to res uh, reconstitute, uh, rescue her from uh, this abject status of, um, of uh, civilian killing. And so uh, these stories are uh, a part of, of the you know, gigantic iceberg of the social experience of Korean War at the grassroots level, which still, uh, needs to be accounted for. And last year, I mean this year actually, July 2021, for the first time in Korean history, the Picasso's very famous painting, Masaka and Kohei, uh, managed to uh, uh, come to Seoul and it attracted huge public attention. And and because of this painting, Picasso has been an uh, uh, unmentionable name of an artist after the Korean War, up until mid or late 1970s, particularly this painting of uh, Massacre in Korea was, um, was, an, was an artifact that no art student could actually publicly mention. But now it, is, it came uh, for the first time and then um, uh, it's uh, public, the South Korean public are free to have a view. And um, <clears throat> the, um, the vista of uh, uh, public history of Korean War uh, start changing again in, in that society. And then uh, I'm sure uh, the, it will continue to uh, change, um, hopefully in more democratic and um, in forms. Um, I will, it, just one minute then, since I started the concept of neutrality um, with, in relation to the, um, uh, the contradiction between international and judiciary notion of neutrality and the impossible of being neutral in this part of the world, and neutrality means uh, actually, uh, 
uh, to volunteer to an abject status in this part of the world because you are forced to take side, right? And that's fate of all the all the um, living citizens or living humans in this part of the world, and and uh, and then those who refuse to do so, uh, uh, what they have to go through by not taking sides. So I end this paper by saying that is in even in the most impossible circumstances, unlike what the um, gentleman in uh, joint security area emphatically said, many ordinary Koreans <clears throat> strove to carve out niches of mutual survival and of freedom from enmity. And stories of these human dramas have been slowly being rescued from public obliv oblivion since the end of the Cold War, which is one good thing about the end of the Cold War in this part of the world. The recovery of the historian Kim Song Chil diaries is one example of recent historical uh, development and scholarship, which also shapes the narrative joint security area. Right, and then I'll end with one, uh, uh, one note um, in an important war story published in 1960. It's called The Public Square, auspiciously titled the celebrated Korean writer Chain Hun writes of the final moments of Myungjun, a philosophy student and communist prisoner of war, originally from South Korea. And the uh, student, the Myungjun is on a trip on a ship to a neutral country, together with other northern POWs who refused either to settle in the south, they had a given, they were given a choice by the US administration, or to return to the north. And the ship is named after Tagore, the famous Indian philosopher. And unlike other former comrades who are anxiously imagining, imagining a place of neutrality and a new life in such a place, they were going to Argentina and India and etc. Myungjun comes to a sudden realization that, like the narrator, narrator in a joint security area, at the end of the day, he doesn't think there is any such place in the wide world, right? in his native land or elsewhere. Then he throws himself into the waves of the Indian Ocean. And the soldiers of Joint Security Area story, uh, written many years afterwards, came to the same realization in the end. So I, my last remark is their despair is historically real. However, so are the many arduous pursuits to find a such a place during and after the war. Thank you. Uh, we're very pleased to see uh, Cold War Crucible yeah. um, up there. I had the uh, honor of hosting Najibu at Vanderbilt for a talk hmm. uh, well, uh, three or four years ago. Um, and that brings me to a technical question, and then I want to ask another one. Uh, connected to that. One is, is it possible now to do fundamentally uh, Cold War research in Japanese archives uh, about the about Japan's rise that um, is now, uh, are state archives now open in Japan to researchers to do actual historical research in the manner in which we can do research? They say yes and no. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's one question. The other is to ask you, um, I fully understand the sort of rethinking of the Korean War on the South Korean side that's taken place. Uh, you know, part of that is, of course, an aspect of South Korea's enormous success as a sort of a, a, now a, a, a superpower, an economic superpower of its own that now is open to this type of, and a democratic power. Um, to what extent, is there acknowledgement that this can only be done in one half of the peninsula? Hmm. That it's really, that even if the Korean War is a much more complicated moral story, one part of the peninsula still is not part of that conversation because hmm. of the existence of a really an extraordinary repressive human rights violating uh, northern government. 
Yeah, yeah. It's uh, always, I mean, in everybody's back of mind. And then, <clears throat> but I, my approach to this is the, um, whatever happens in the South for the future is good for both, right? As long as that work of memory is done uh, in constructive spirit, right? And in so democratization of public memory, if someone has to lead, I mean, in South Korea society as well, it's very complicated. I was talking to uh, colleagues during, uh, because there was a, <clears throat> the uh, South Korea is, is vibrant in many ways, but it's very, very divided society too. And um, especially in regard to the memory of war is, is, uh, it's not an easy topic, but, uh, but the public historians and people like myself, anthropologists, uh, these do uh, continue to work on it. And uh, I must say that I've given some of the best uh, experience I had in public speech were small local groups who 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 who, who don't know who, who don't know what to do with the local memories, right? And then and then we meet them and um, the so it, it and some of many of them are just local primary school teachers and they they don't know how to teach their uh, students about uh, about the um, about the the major event of the past that still shapes many family histories. And, um, so these are all good, and I think the the one one thing that uh, that I uh, I I tell them. Is that uh, you know exactly your point? You know this is is so partial. You know what are you going to do with the northern half, um, which um, it stubbornly holds on to very state centric uh, um, uh, story of the war. I mean, at the then uh, my answer is then you have to go more you have to go further you have to go you have to go extra mile and you have to work harder to democratize um the memory of war so that one day the the fruits of this work can be shared by uh the thinking people and conscientious people in the north when when the time comes and uh, but the so uh, <clears throat> At the level of the state, and <laughs> I have no idea what to do. And uh, but mind you that concerning the um, international aspect, the Sino-American aspect of the Korean War, which is becoming really empowered these days um, across the Pacific Oceans, is frightening. And um, and uh, I was uh, talking to a few colleagues. Uh, in local universities where this uh, old battlefield fields are located, perhaps we can build a small, nice, creative memorial, right? Even though the <clears throat> the Asiatic bonds went back to Shenyang and state whatever, and then Eurasian bonds went to Hawaii and further further afield, and these two groups of souls once were neighbors here right here, and then uh, a tribute to their uh, common and joint and communal existence. And then, and then what, what those uh, people who underwent this, um, um, the destruction of war, um, those who fought in it, um, we know in in uh, European cultural history, the uh, they are the first who say no more war. So, uh, how to bring 
the fallen soldier's voice into the, make, the making of peace rather than a new uh, form of geopolitical contest of power is, uh, is a very serious question indeed. And, and um, yes, yes. Um, there, we have an online question. Right. And there's a very long comment, but I'll just uh, uh, read the question. Right. Thank you for this. I'll read it for you guys. Thank you for this thought provoking -provo paper. I'm interested in the return of the Korean War in China's East Asian foreign policy. Do you know what kind of political and social initiative they were carried out at the graveyard of the Chinese soldiers fallen in North Korea? Oh, God, this is. Um, it's it's increasingly important site, yeah. and then uh, the paramount leaders, from current leaders, father Kim Kim Jong Il, um, one of the most important public um, obligations to visit this grave and to pay tribute to the, to the fallen soldiers of uh, Chinese soldiers, and particularly the Mao Zedong's eldest son Mao Anning's grave. And how the Korean media, North and South, perceive this event. Oh, God, yes. Um, in Vietnam, the Chinese embassy in the last 10 years began to carry out commemorative rituals at some of the war cemeteries of Chinese soldiers and volunteers fallen while fighting alongside the North Vietnamese army during the Vietnam War, oh, which I didn't know about. And these events often carefully planned and kept hidden from public view, uh, particularly conspicuous as they are often preluded and following certain progress in US Vietnam normalization and reconciliation. I do work in part uh, in the sphere of uh, sociology and anthropology that is broadly called the politics of dead bodies. You know, and we know in Vietnam War history, um, uh, the post-war history from 75 to 93, the, um, the MIA, uh, the, 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 the um, bodies are accounted for a major diplomatic um, uh, predicament in the normalization of uh, relations between two nations. And um, North Korea, uh, the, North Korea and the United States did have um, um, body-related political relations during the Clinton era. And um, after 9-11, it was all chucked away and uh, with the, um, uh, the, uh, the statements such as axis of evil and everything, and it, it discontinued. And um, so the, I think, I it, I can I can safely say that if we follow um, the movement of human bones, the bones of the fallen in this part of it in this part of the world, you can see really clearly where the power is, how the power changes. Right. So it's a very important topic. I agree with you, but the thing is, the thing is. The, these are good, but the, the modern state, modern state has uh, developed uh, incredibly, incredibly sophisticated technology, both in uh, scientific and artistic terms, uh, in dealing with the remains of the fallen. But it hasn't, it hasn't developed any remotely similar technology in relation to the to the bodies of unknown and unaccounted for who are not part of the combatants. So the, the, the fate of the civilian victims of war is, is, is always a difficult issue. But, the, um, but in, 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 in Korean War, um, the, I think what it, it is safe to say that these things, this geopolitics of the fate of the remains of fallen soldiers is going on, right? Uh, between the United States and China. And um, 
And then it, when the MIA mission is being resumed between North Korea and uh, Pyongyang and Washington, ah, that's good news. And it's something is start moving, I think. That the, I think it's so in, in some ways, it's the, 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 the human remains continue to take a central position in the, uh, in the modern geopolitics. But, but we should, we should not forget the, the, you know, the whereabouts and destiny of, of, um, the humans who, um, who, who the states, both Asian or non-Asian, are far less interested with the 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 remains of civilians. You know where are these two hundred thousand civilians? Their remains are, and and then <clears throat> what? Uh, how how to remember their uh, tragic fate creatively? Is uh, at the end of which is not. It's 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 I uh, I think is what uh, defines the um, democratic memory of war. At the end of that, so we shouldn't. I mean, geopolitics is interesting, but you know uh, we should not um, forget the fact that it, there is uh, there is something uh, more than geopolitics in remembering war. <laughs> Um, I now have the great pleasure to uh, introduce to you uh, Professor Mitchell uh, Lerner, who's uh, at uh, Ohio State University, the director of the Institute of East Asian uh, Studies uh, Center uh, there, uh, and uh, who's written, um, goodness, I couldn't, uh, I'd use up all his time probably if I gave a list of all his publications. So I'll just see, you know, he's done a great deal of work on the Johnson administration. Um, the Pe Pueblo incident and uh, a number of uh, other works. Uh, and he's going to talk to us today uh, about earning their civil rights, the Korean War, and the forgotten struggle for African American equality. So I will hand it over to you. Um, I, I want to talk today about the Korean War, which is something that obviously I've talked about a lot in my roughly 20 years in the academic world, but I'm going to do it a little differently this time. Um, I want to start, though, by noting that although this is going to be a little bit different, most of the talks that I've given about the Korean War are all rooted in one central principle, um, and this one is the same. And I think that any conversation about the Korean War should start, there we go, starts with this heading, um, with the idea that Korea is not just the forgotten war, it's the most underappreciated war. And, and that's central to what I want to talk to you about today. I want to clarify that quickly, though, with two points. Um, first, when I say underappreciated, obviously, I know wars are terrible and brutal things. And so when I say the Korean War is underappreciated, um, I don't mean that we should be glorifying it. I certainly am not wishing for another one. Um, I mean underappreciated in terms of the lack of recognition of the larger impact that the war had on the 20th century world. So, so just understand that when I, I call the war underappreciated, I am not, you know, I'm not pining for another task force Smith or a, a, a battle of Bloody Ridge. Um, I'm just hoping to move beyond the immediate horrors of the war and recognize the larger significance of the war in the 20th century world. And the second qualifier that I want to give when I talk about Korea as being underappreciated, I am explicitly not saying that the Korean War is the most important war of the 20th century. Obviously, I think the Korean War is really important. I've spent much of my life studying it. Uh, but even I think that it would be hard to make a case that the Korean War was more important than, say, the defeat of Nazi Germany. So when I say the war is more underappreciated than any other war of the uh, 20th century, at least from the American perspective. Um, I, I just am trying to suggest that the war had larger ramifications for the world that aren't discussed enough, particularly at, outside of the academic circle. So um, I'm certainly not the first person to suggest that the Korean War had ramifications that went beyond the 38th parallel, um, but those arguments are usually internationally focused, and they certainly are when I talk about the war. So 
you know, I, I have often talked about the larger ramifications of the war, and I talk about things like uh, how the Korean War militarized American foreign policy, how it, it led policymakers to replace the idea of skillful diplomatic efforts with a new emphasis on military capabilities and an almost constant state of war preparedness. Uh, or I talk about how the war hardened animosities across the Korean Peninsula or East Asia as a whole that still define the current environment. Or I talk about how the Korean War, uh, I think on a positive note, helped convince policymakers and military leaders across the globe that limited wars could be fought, which I think established an important precedent for the second half of the 20th century. Uh, or I talk about how it's cemented in the minds of American policymakers and certainly the American public, this vision, this simplistic vision of a, uh, a Soviet or a Chinese puppet master totally controlling their third world communist puppet allies, which encouraged this vision of this, this kind of very black and white simplistic worldview that hindered any uh, American policymakers' recognition of the importance of decolonization or nationalism or imperialism uh, in policymaking, and, and which I think helped encourage some of the disasters, particularly in Vietnam, that came later. But today I'm going to make an entirely different argument. Um, today I'm going to talk about Korea mattering so much in a way that shifts the focus from the international to the domestic inside the United States. And, and I'll tell you that I, I sort of stumbled across this topic a few years ago in a way that I think anyone in the academic world can probably relate to. It was completely by accident when I was working on something entirely different. So a few years ago, um, I was reading through old African-American newspapers from the 1950s. I, I literally don't remember why I was doing this, but I was. Uh, and one day I was reading through the Cleveland Call and Post, a big African-American newspaper here in Ohio. And I came to this date. July 15th, 1950. This is, of course, just a few weeks after North Korea invaded South Korea, sparking the Korean War. And here I found two op-eds or two editorials on the editorial page of the Cleveland Call and Post, July 15th, 1950. One is what we call above the fold, right? It's, it's on the top half of the newspaper. And there's an op-ed written by the editors of the Cleveland Call and Post. It is reprinted here. It's called, There Are No Shortcuts. And I'm, I'm sure you can't read it, but I will cut to the chase and sum it up for you. There Are No Shortcuts was an editorial written by the Cleveland Column Post leadership endorsing an African-American role in the Korean War. And it concludes that, quote, no matter what the issues behind the enrollment in Korea, the United States of America needs waste no sleep over the loyalty of its 15 million Negro sub-citizens. The Negro has learned from bitter experience that his fate is inextricably enmeshed with the fate of this nation. And therefore, only the most stupid American Negro will be found doing or saying anything calculated to prevent American Negroes from giving an all out effort to return triumphant the American cause in the Korean adventure. Okay, they're on board. Except on the very same page beneath the fold, right on the bottom half of the newspaper, there's a dissenting editorial written by one of the other members of the editorial board. This comes from Charles Loeb. Uh, Loeb was one of the most famous war correspondents of the time, an African-American journalist who had covered World War II to some distinction and then joined the Cleveland Call and Post editorial staff. He also had a habit of writing op-eds in really, really bad poetry. So on that same date, he offers a dissenting view in an editorial in rhyme, and it's much more critical and it concludes in this last stanza that, quote, this war ain't right. An old man Brown ain't fooled by diplomatic talk. We're fighting because some colored folks have dared to use the middle walk. But lift that bale and tote that barge and see that ammunition sails. We're all Americans right now, no matter how they kick our tails. So on an immediate level, these two editorials jumped out at me just as being really interesting, right, because of their obvious contrast. But on a larger level, it made me realize that we don't hear much in the historical literature about the relationship between the Korean War on one hand and America's domestic civil rights movement on the other, at least not in the way that we do World War II or Vietnam. 
Now, many of you are no doubt familiar with the sort of general historical narrative about the relationship between America's 20th century military conflicts and the civil rights struggle at home. The more traditional view goes kind of like this, and I'll, I'll be really simplistic just to get us started, but, but this traditional view holds that there's almost a straight line evolutionary path from World War I to Vietnam, right? So in this view, World War I begins and African-Americans decide to place military service ahead of their domestic civil rights effort. Because according to this view, um, they see in the war an opportunity to prove themselves. They're gonna serve, they're gonna fight. That's gonna show white Americans that they too are good citizens of their country. And from that will come full citizenship. So famously wrote the African-American newspaper, Richmond Planet in 1917, colored folks should be patriotic. Do not let us be chargeable with being disloyal to the flag. But of course the discrimination they faced and, and I've just written four chapters for a forthcoming book about this, uh, in the training camps to prepare for war, in the draft, in their treatment overseas, and then the obvious conflict in the rhetoric between fighting a war to make the world safe for democracy and the treatment they were receiving, uh, it, it, it revealed the futility of this strategy. And so studies of World War II argue that there's a shift in the movement to a less cooperative attitude. It, it, in the literature on World War II for a long time, we said uh, African-Americans still serve and fight patriotically, but this time they demand domestic reform at the same time. And this is most famously encapsulated by another African-American newspaper, the Pittsburgh Courier, which called for famously the double V campaign, right? Double victory, victory over fascism abroad, victory over racism at home. Now they're gonna happen at the same time and military service will be part of it. Of course, that didn't work very well either as many of you no doubt know. And so then the narrative holds Vietnam takes us to the next stage. Uh, Vietnam in this story stands as the logical culmination. It's that moment when um, the, the internal contradictions of the American promise and the American reality are finally torn asunder on the, asunder on the battlefields of Southeast Asia. African-Americans served in Vietnam, of course. Many did so with great patriotism and enthusiasm, but many others openly resented their service. Um, and, and many uh, completely rejected America's call to arms, pointing directly to the hypocrisy of their domestic standing and America's claims to be fighting on behalf of the free world. And here, of course, most of you know Muhammad Ali, who declared that he was not going 10,000 miles from home to help murder and burn another poor nation, simply to continue the domination of white slave masters of the darker people of the world over said it once and I'll say it again, Ali famously said, the real enemy of my people is right here. So although it's a bit of an oversimplification, um, one might trace with, uh, you, you can sort of sum up the traditional literature like this. World War I says African-Americans put their cooperation in the war effort ahead of their domestic protest for equality. World War II brings us to the next stage where that cooperation in the war effort coexists at the same time with the protest for equality at home. And then in Vietnam, we've reversed the order, we've come full circle and we reach the stage of protest at home instead of cooperation in the war effort. Missing from this though, and kudos to me for my mad tech skills that I can get Korea to bounce across the screen like that. Luckily I have teenage kids to help me. Um, Korea is missing from the narrative, right? We never hear about Korea in the story. Now, it, it, to, to be fair, I should note that a few decades ago, historians began challenging this somewhat simplistic picture on a lot of levels. And no doubt you are all, most of you are familiar with what we call the long civil rights movement, right? A movement that was far more complicated than, than this simplistic picture I've given you depicts, uh, is far more economically progressive, is far more evolved in the North than we had originally thought, is, is far more driven by women than originally recognized. Um, and, and particularly spans a longer time period than this framework suggests and finds the origins of civil rights unrest in World War I. And, and, and my portrayal agrees with that. And in, in my chapters on World War I, I think we, we find a lot more domestic civil unrights, unrest than this portrayal suggests. Nevertheless, though, in all of these stories, in all of this depiction, Korea gets largely ignored. So, so in this talk, I wanna do three things. 
First, I just want to put the Korean War back in the story by considering how the African American home front and soldiers responded to that striking dichotomy of being told that we're going to fight on behalf of the free world, and yet the racism that they experienced while doing the people being the people doing much of the fighting. I also want to suggest that the Korean War is actually an overlooked but vital point of transition in terms of the radicalization of the civil rights movement at home, helping push reformers away from that more accommodationist attitude and more towards the more overtly combative anti-American stance that we normally associate with Vietnam. And in the end, I wanna argue that the story of the Korean War and the struggle for civil rights is that the two views expressed in the Cleveland Call and Post that I started us with, that they did exist side by side throughout the war, but they didn't exist equally throughout. And that instead for roughly that first year of the war, the more pro-American integrationist attitude dominated. And then because of a number of specific battlefield moments, the transition occurred for the next couple of years in the war and we got that more anti-American sentiment. So onto the Korean War. Uh, we all know the story, North Korean forces crossed the 38th parallel in June of 1950 and the first major superpower conflict of the Cold War begins. And with it, of course, comes the question of African-American support. The immediate reaction was quite positive. Civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph pictured here gave voice to the sentiments of many in June 1950 when he spoke before a rally in Harlem and declared that, quote, while our boys, Negro and white, Jew and Gentile, Catholic and Protestant, are fighting and dying to establish a beachhead in Korea for liberty and peace, let no man or woman of America fall to so vile and low an estate as to lend his support to the sordid and unmoral business of propaganda guerrilla warfare here at home. And, and if you know anything about Randolph, you know he had been a pretty strong advocate for a more combative civil rights approach. So this is really kind of out of character for him. Um, this support, I should know, isn't blind. Few of the African-American supporters of the war in this early period denied the racial problems that characterized their own nation. Still, they generally accepted the idea that victory in Korea was necessary and that the African-American community needed to play a role. Well, the Chicago Defender, Quote, the Negro has rallied to the defense of the American flag in every crisis in the nation's history. Whatever the future holds, we shall stand together in solid opposition to the Russian menace. Now, I want to note from the start that there's a lot of reasons underlying this initial support that existed in many, many, in many of the American conflicts that existed before Korea as well. So, so a lot of this isn't necessarily new. These reasons range from genuine patriotism, to a fear of communism, to concerns about violent retribution at home if they were to appear to be insufficiently patriotic, to more mundane factors like the, the, the war meant economic opportunities and, and job training and the opportunity to travel and the excitement of fighting. So, so to some extent, the, that first year, and I've been through all of the, the writing and the newspaper and the oral histories, it very much resonates with the same response that we saw to earlier American conflicts. But I think there's two elements that are different this time. The positive initial response is shaped by two new factors. First, this one, Executive Order 9981 in 1948 which uh, President Truman used to order the integration of the American Armed Services. Now, there's obviously a lot more to the story than that. And we can talk about it later if we want. It doesn't really order integration. It only sort of does. Um, and although many African-American leaders were, I think, reasonably con concerned about the vague details of the order and the lack of any enforcement mechanisms, and, and many of them recognized the obvious political benefits that would accrue to Truman in the 1948 election. Nevertheless, I think most African-Americans accepted this as a first step towards progress and as a uh, genuine gesture of good faith from the administration. And they were fairly confident that it would continue. So when the war broke out, many African-Americans, I think, felt a need to uphold their end of the bargain and prove themselves on the battlefields of Korea without 
encouraging domestic unrest at the same time, uh, and at least to some extent trusted the Truman administration to recognize these sacrifices and reward uh, the gain and reward them for doing so by continuing the gains of this executive order. As one recently drafted soldier explained, quote, I am just another American fighting for his country, not a second class citizen anymore. I've got an opportunity in a future and I'm going to prove I'm worthy of them. The second new factor in Korea is, of course, the origins of the Cold War. And I mean that in two ways. Uh, first, on a, on a most immediate and basic level, many African Americans genuinely regarded Korea as vital to the, to the effort to hold off the spread of communism, a system that many viewed as, as even worse than American racism, as bad as it was. Others, though, and, and this might be more relevant, others, I think, saw Korea as an opportunity to advance the civil rights cause by pointing to the growing importance of the Asia frontier in the Cold War struggle, and therefore the importance of winning over Asian populations, which of course was gonna be difficult in light of America's own racial struggles, right? As, as we all know, communist powers often used America's racial problems in its propaganda. A message that civil rights leaders at home often pointed out would particularly resonate, resonate among the non-white people of Asia during this time of crisis. And, and you can see just posted here, one of the famous Soviet propaganda posters from 1948, showing their people like this is life under capitalism and under communism. So accordingly, I think the African-American media frequently pushed for better treatment um, at home as a vital tool for combating enemy propaganda and winning over the hearts and minds of those people in East Asia who had now suddenly been thrust into the front lines of this struggle between uh, the United States and the communist world. Wrote, again, the Cleveland Call and Post, what Asiatic country teeming with dark-skinned people could trust its future well-being under democracy if what was known about the Negro's plight here was to be true? So together, I think these two factors helped drive the early response towards enthusiastic support of the war in Korea. Now, as we'll see in a minute, this support falls apart pretty quickly. But I want to diverge from that theme and, and, and go off on a tangent for a minute, because this is uh, a bit of the research that I'm currently doing right now. And I want to offer one quick tangential point about the African-American experience in Korea. Um, and because I'm just exploring this now, I'm not 100% sure what the conclusions are going to be. But I think it's really interesting. So I wanted to just broach it with you quickly. And that is the relationship between the African-American soldier overseas and the Korean people. Now, the Black press painted a picture of kindness and open-mindedness of African-American soldiers towards the local Koreans, which they frequently attributed to the idea that African-American soldiers could understand racial discrimination uh, against people of, uh, of color in general, better than white American soldiers. And of course, because they knew that the American civil rights problem was having this, this resonance in the Cold War. Um, and so this was a constant theme in the coverage of the black press. In fact, it's really interesting to me to see how the African American media tried to thread a really difficult needle because they also didn't want to make two direct attacks on white soldiers as being racist because that would sort of discredit the whole war effort, right? They didn't want to say white soldiers are are full of racism also, because after all, they're trying to rally their people for a struggle on behalf of the free world. And so what we see in the African-American press is praise for white American soldiers for treating Koreans well, but just not as well as African-American soldiers are treating them. It's, it's a really, it, so it's like, uh, it suddenly jumps, in, jumps out at me. It's like George Orwell and Animal Farm, right? All animals are created equal, but some are more equal than others. And, and that's kind of how this was. All American soldiers are good, but African-American soldiers are better. And so we see this theme over and over again. So, so the Jackson Advocate from Mississippi, a, a small town uh, African-American newspaper in 1951 had a great article about how um, almost all American units overseas had sort of adopted a local, they all adopted their own um, small Korean boy to be like their mascot. And it sings the praises of how well these uh, mascots are being treated, but noted that, quote, Koreans say that the kids adopted by American Negro soldiers are better treated, better dressed, and better mannered than those adopted by whites. 
anyway, as, as I have looked through the oral histories and the letters home and the diaries, um, I confess that I don't really buy this argument. Demeaning racial terms for Koreans and Asians in general are actually used pretty regularly by African-American soldiers and acts of violence against North Koreans are justified in language that clearly dehumanizes them. And I don't see any sort of qualitative or quantitative difference in the way African-American soldiers express these feelings and white American soldiers express their feelings. In September 1950, one soldier, for example, quoted in a North Carolina newspaper said that he, quote, got some nice souvenirs including a Russian pistol and two gook skulls. Another wrote that he'd wiped out some enemy, but quote, wasn't sure how many of the animals he had killed. Even South Korean allies who were generally liked and respected as partners in battle were still described as inferiors. One African-American war correspondent described them as quote, semi-primitive. Another described them as living in a quote, near primitive state. One African-American soldier learned that they, quote, learned to smell them. They had different body odors. You could sense them. You could smell them. Another African-American soldier explained that, quote, we were there because people like them needed people like us to show them a better way of living. So anyway, more than I think the Black press wanted to recognize, African-Americans also put the war within a framework of racial hierarchy that had Koreans on a lower level. And so that begs the question of why. And here we come to the part where I'm still kind of unsure and tentative and, and I'm eager to hear anyone's thoughts or, 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 or reactions later on. But, but I'll offer four hypotheses as to why African-American soldiers did not offer greater racial sensitivity. One is that, and I guess this is probably typical for soldiers everywhere. Um, it's a simple defense mechanism that allows you to kill people more easily, right? I mean, if you're gonna go into battle and hurt people, it's a lot easier to do so if you dehumanize them and think of them as, as more like animals than people. Another hypothesis is that I think it helped African-Americans to advance their efforts at home and their sort of collective sense of self by portraying themselves and seeing themselves as helping inferiors, right? This is, look, it's sort of like they were saying, look what good people we are. We are really bringing the meaning of American freedom equality to people who need our help, right? We're, more so than white soldiers, we, rep recognize, we represent you know, the rhetoric of American equality. We're helping these inferior races. A third hypothesis, and this is similar, I guess, um, is that this was a way for African-American African soldiers to demonstrate their ability to advance in the modern world, that much of the rhetoric coming out of the racist South in the United States argued that African-Americans simply could not survive in modernity without whites to guide them. And here I think are African-Americans drawing a contrast between themselves and the Korean people to say, look how far we have come in, in, in opposition to these, right, in comparison to these primitive people, clearly we can thrive and survive and deserve a greater level of equality. Finally, I think it's worth noting that there is some resentment between African-American soldiers and the fact that the American army admitted South Korean soldiers into their ranks to fight beside them almost as equals. And, and, and in, so in truth, they really didn't. Um, there, there's a ton of racism, obviously, between white American soldiers and their South Korean allies, but the white media really doesn't portray it that way. The white media portrays it as a, a great band of harmonious warriors and African-Americans who of course have been segregated for decades turned to resent this. Um, so the Pittsburgh Courier, another African-American paper had an editorial in 1951 entitled, quote, an insult in Korea. And it noted that quote, integration of alien Koreans into the citizen army of the United States is a pure insult which burns deep into the soul of every black American. So I think there's some issue there. So, so I don't know exactly where this part of this chapter is going to end up, but, but that's my hypothesis and just sort of an interesting tangent before I take us back to the actual Korean War. So let's go back to the Korean War and let's start here. When the war begins, American support rallies behind the war effort. And a huge part of that is the story of the 24th Infantry. 24th Infantry um, was part of the 25th Infantry Division of the U.S. 8th Army. It is, of course, segregated. It's the only completely African-American regiment in the war. Uh, and when war begins, the 24th is quickly dispatched to Korea. After a two-day battle in July, they capture the somewhat strategically important town of Yechon, 
with two dead and 12 wounded. It was one of the first victories of the war for the United States. Some argue it was the first victory. And it propelled the 24th to absolutely glorious status within the African-American community, um, which just worshiped the 24th. I, I note this is all despite the fact that the official army history of the war for many years uh, falsely claimed that the North Koreans had actually fled and there was no actual fighting at this battle. But the 24th became just sort of almost superhuman in the eyes of the African-American community. Uh, on page one, the Amsterdam Daily News spoke of the quote, hell fighting Negro GIs of the 24th Infantry and claimed that they'd been specifically chosen by the top brass who needed their best troops for this important battle. But maybe more, even more important than African-American coverage, white American media and white political and military leaders sung the praises of the 24th. President Truman, Douglas MacArthur, both singled them out for public praise. The Chicago Defender, which is an African-American uh, newspaper, has a huge page, like a, a half page above the fold, that's a collage of positive things uttered by American leaders and uh, white American leaders and white American media um, about the 24th. And it's this, this beautiful sort of panorama of quotes and statements. A Massachusetts congressman goes to the floor of Congress and declares that, quote, all of us should offer a prayer of thanks to the regulars of this Negro regiment for shaming us out of our fears, and on and on. In the eyes of many African Americans, the racist tide of the country seemed to be changing. The Korean War and the 24th Infantry seemed to be paving the way. The good feelings wouldn't last. Within a year of fighting, as I said earlier, the Korean War, I think, actually reverses the trend and reminds the African-American community of their subordinate status in a way that makes the situation at home even worse. And I will, I'll leave you with four particular issues that I think lay at the heart of this reversal. The first one has been covered a lot in the literature, so I won't really go through it very much. And, and that's the controversy over the FEPC, the Fair Employment Practices Commission. Um, when the war began, African-Americans began demanding their fair share of the inevitable jobs in the defense industry that were going to emerge and, and claiming it as their right in the wake of the military sacrifices that they were making. So in July, the Truman administration proposed a bill establishing an FEPC, which would be empowered to enforce non-discrimination policies in businesses and unions with more than 50 people. Now it's worth noting that a similar bill had been proposed earlier and right before the war, I think in May, it had been defeated by a Senate filibuster by Southern conservatives. But now African-American leaders assumed the presence of African-American soldiers fighting and dying in Korea had obviously changed that calculus um, and given them a a position where no one could possibly oppose. Well, of course, as, as we all know and won't be surprised, Southern conservatives again defeated the bill. They launched a filibuster. They claimed that this was socialism. You know, how ironic would it be that our men were fighting overseas against socialism, but we'd have socialism at home when the government took control of business. They argued that it would hurt industrial production in this critical moment and various other reasons. So in the end, the FEPC was defeated going a long way towards convincing the African-American community that the Korean War was not going to help advance their cause. Three other issues though that have been less covered come from the battlefields of Korea themselves. All of these I think soon eclipse the FEPC, although the, domestic, the, the literature in the United States I think of the war, except for the military community uh, has long, has generally overlooked these. Uh, the first one, so this is I guess, this is critical point, moment number two, involves just one person. This is First Lieutenant Leon Gilbert pictured here. Gilbert was first, uh, was executive officer of Company A in the 1st Battalion of the 24th Infantry. And on July 31st, 1950, he fled from combat and then refused a direct order from his acting commander to lead a group of African-American soldiers back to the fighting. Gilbert claimed that the unit's poor equipment and heavy losses made this a futile effort, and he pointed to some alleged health problems of his own. He was nevertheless brought up on charges of misbehavior in the presence of the enemy and imprisoned. And from prison, he would write to his wife that, quote, 
I'm now under arrest for not carrying out an order which would have led me and 12 other men to certain death. In August, he was court-martialed on the front lines, a trial conducted by seven white officers, found guilty and sentenced to death. Ironically, what happens next is kind of ironic in the way this becomes such a huge cause. Some white political and military leaders who were opposed to the integration of the American military and, and favored segregation in the military and beyond helped to publicize the case in the belief that this would demonstrate the inferiority of African Americans and their unreliability in combat and help preserve the Army's se uh, segregation. And so they publicly talked about this to try to bring it into public consciousness. Even President Truman, it's worth noting, was harsh. He told the New Yorker that, quote, if I'd been this fellow's commanding officer, we wouldn't have needed any trial at all. We would have handled it in our own way. But for the African-American community, Gilbert quickly became a standard of the racial double standards that defined the American military and American society overall. Public outcry sprang up immediately. In late 1950, Gilbert's wife publicly requested that Truman commute the sentence and the African-American community mobilized behind her. Now it's worth noting, few argued that Gilbert was innocent. He wasn't, the facts were clear. He had by his own admission fled combat and disobeyed a direct order. Instead, the outrage reflected not the specifics of the case, but the way it reflected the larger failures of the American military in its treatment of African-American soldiers in Korea. So most common was the argument that while Gilbert had indeed defied orders, lots of white soldiers had defied similar orders and received much lighter consequences. Others argued that Gilbert was a victim of structural racism in the army, which because of his race had failed to provide him with the necessary training and the necessary weapons, had denied him adequate food and sleep in the nights before the incident, had put him under the command of inexperienced and racist officers. Many soldiers who served with Gilbert supported these claims with stories of inadequate material support and training and frequent tales of racist officers, all of which were covered in the black media. In fact, the Colonel who ordered name ironically is Colonel White, Colonel White, who had ordered Gilbert back to the front lines is later investigated by the army once this becomes a big case. And he declares to the army investigator that quote, a Negro unit is about twice as hard to handle. They're a difficult problem in certain aspects as regard to discipline. They're inclined to cause irritation and trouble in the areas in which they're quartered. And they can be pretty rough and bullying when it comes to dishing it out on a field of battle, they, but on a field of battle, they can't take it. And so soon, Gilbert's case just became a firestorm of public protest. Asked one African-American in a letter to the editor to the Pittsburgh Courier, qu uh, quote, the treatment of Negro troops in Korea is serving as a highlight of the oppression of the whole Negro people in America. Negro youth should ask themselves this question, does their fighting in Korea mean freedom for the Negro people in America? The answer is obvious. As Lieutenant Gilbert sits in an army jail, even as more Negro soldiers are sent overseas, police brutality against Negro youth increases and discrimination and Jim Crow remain unchallenged by the rulers of America. Gilbert's case, however, soon focused attention on a larger issue, which brings us to the third issue I wanted to broach. And that was the uh, inadequacy of the, and the endemic racism of the court martial system itself. African-Americans soon noticed the inadequacy of Gilbert's court-martial defense. Gilbert's army appointed lawyer barely spoke during his trial, which again ended with him being sentenced to death. He declined to cross-examine witnesses. He failed to obtain testimony from any of the people who Gilbert said would exonerate him. And he offered literally no closing argument. Under growing public outcry, the NAACP sent Thurgood Marshall to investigate the entire system. And Marshall went to Korea and Japan for a few months. In 1951, Marshall produced a detailed report pointing to numerous problems with the whole court martial system, citing in particular the high proportion of African Americans charged in comparison to whites, the relative brevity of their trial and the paucity of their defense, and the hostile atmosphere in which the trials took place that Marshall said made it impossible for an African-American soldier to get a fair trial. Um, his evidence is incontroversial. The, the report is really quite amazing. 
Uh, just to give you a couple quick bullet points, he notes that African American troops were 28% of the 25th Regiment. They're 28% of the soldiers. They were 97% of the court martial convictions, right? 28% of the soldiers, 97% of the court martial convictions. Uh, 32 African American soldiers in this regiment, the 25th, 32 were convicted. 30 of them got punishments of 10 or more years. Only two white soldiers are convicted of similar charges in the same time period. Both of them got lesser punishments. Dozens of accused told stories of not getting to meet their defense lawyer until the day of the trial. Of witnesses who were capable of exonerating them who were suddenly sent elsewhere the day of the trial by the army and were therefore not available to testify on their behalf. Of courts whose jury slept through their trial. Of the 32 African Americans convicted in this regiment, four of them had trials that lasted less than 45 minutes, but all got life sentences. Thurgood Marshall concluded that, quote, I've seen many miscarriages of justice in my capacity as head of the NAACP legal department, but even in Mississippi, a Negro will get a trial longer than 42 minutes. In the wake of, of Marshall's report, again, African-American sentiment mobilizes around the court martial issue, especially the contradiction between the rhetoric of fighting on behalf of the free world and the reality of the blatantly discriminatory system of military justice that those doing the fighting were experiencing. And as this pushes us in a more combative direction at home, it is amplified to, to take us right back to where we started with the larger treatment of the 24th. I talked about the 24th earlier, how they had won that Battle of Yechon and had been propelled to glorious status among the African-American community, not just because of what it meant for the African-American community themselves, but because of the equal treatment and the praise they seem to be getting from the leaders of American white community, both military and political leaders, except pretty quickly that falls apart and it is reversed. The problems begin almost immediately. I won't go through their military history, but over the next six months, the 24th doesn't do very well. In fact, leaving Yechon, um, they are attacked by North Korean soldiers and they, they beat a pretty hasty and uh, uh, disorganized retreat, which the, the um, white American leadership that comes to investigate reports that it's because of their race, um, concluding that African-American soldiers in general were about quote, 80% of white troops. Um, and, and it just goes on from there. At what point um, a white commanding officer has his soldiers build a barbed wire fence around a hill that the African-American troops have occupied, which he explains he to his troops he's doing it so that, quote, the colored troops won't run. Their reputation quickly collapses. There are a series of articles in white newspapers, particularly after the Chinese intervention, about how African American soldiers so quickly break and run. Um, I won't. I've got a whole list of them. I won't go through them in the interest of time. Uh, but but it is repeated over and over again. And and while of course it is true, and and the twenty fourth and others did not exactly cover themselves with glory. Anybody who knows anything about the Korean War knows that in the wake of the Chinese intervention, lots of American soldiers broke and ran and, and, and beat hasty retreats south. Um, there's a really interesting, for anybody who's, who's interested in this topic, there's a really interesting article in the Saturday Evening Post in, I think it's late 1950. And it's a really long article about the 24th and the African-American soldiers. And the irony is the reporter who's a white reporter thinks of himself as a champion of civil rights. And he's trying to report this, right, this good story about African-American soldiers but it is all so enmeshed in perceptions of racial hierarchy that the rhetoric is full of, it, it portrays African-American soldiers as these sort of simplistic childlike race, lazy and easily fooled and, and just overall uh, um, in need of white soldiers to guide them. I mean, am I, are you waving at me there in the... Yeah, yeah, just five more minutes. I was yeah, just going. Yeah, yeah, and I am quoting. So, so to the African American community, the case of the twenty fourth is is kind of the breaking point. Um, we see the same rhetoric, the same perceptions as we saw with regard to Leon Gilbert. You said that the twenty fourth were, uh, were 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 had been heroic. They obviously had not. But American uh, African American media and leaders talked about how this was the same as Leon Gilbert. They had been given poor weapons, poor training. 
racist officers. They argued that they were um, being given a disproportionate amount of the fighting. Uh, some argued that they were being used as a scapegoat, that white American military commanders had made poor tactical decisions, and now we're just pointing a finger of blame of the 24th. And within the 24th, soldiers actually argued over and over again that the problem was that they had done too well at first and that the white community was worried that they would bring this sense of pride and equality back to the United States and use that as a stepping stone for equality. As one African-American soldier lamented, quote, some people are trying to discredit the regiment. Apparently we have fought too well. So by, by early 1951, the army is integrated, the, the court martial system is improved and Gilbert's sentence is lessened, but the damage had been done. And I will end by taking us right back to where we started. Here is the Cleveland Call and Post again. This is almost a year exactly to the date of when we first started. And you remember we had those two op-eds. Well, here we are again. It's a year later, almost exactly. And once again, Charles Loeb has an op-ed uh, critical of the war effort and pointing to the contradiction between the American rhetoric and the American reality. And it concludes in that in this last paragraph talking about what will await African-American soldiers when they return. And it says, quote, and Dixie courts will sit again and dish out justice for the whites and darker folks will clamor loud that they have earned their civil rights and covenants will take effect and slums will claim their yearly dead and ghosts of fighting men will ask, is it for this we fought and bled? And yet this time, if you remember last time, there's two different op-eds on that same page. Well, this, on this date, this is on the bottom of the fold. Here's what's on the top. There's no dissenting editorial this time. Instead, there is a, a, a cartoon mocking President Truman who a few days earlier had gone to Congress encouraging support for the war. And, I, and you probably can't read this, but they quote him saying that, quote, the free peoples of the world look to us for support in maintaining their freedoms. And yet the backdrop behind him is an African-American man with the colored America labeled across his chest as he stands in, change, in chains under the caption reminding us all that Congress had yet to even pass a civil rights bill. With that, I will conclude uh, African-American th enthusiasm clearly replaced by that familiar sense of disillusionment and hostility that had been exacerbated by their experiences in Korea. And it played a critical role in moving the African-American community towards that confrontational attitude that would mark the next few decades of the civil rights movement and have enormous ramifications at home. So thank you all for listening. Thank you for the invitation. And I am happy to hear any thoughts or comments. Thank you. I have two questions, Mitch. Um, one is um, one factor you left out, and I'm wondering if you deliberately left it out or it's one you just don't see in the evidence, is whether black leaders um, were also, uh, who, who, many, many of whom who had been close to uh, are on the left, were concerned about the McCarthyist type of, of ramifications of opposing uh, intervention in Korea. In some ways, um, if that factor of uh, a fear of being seen uh, as uh, supportive of the communist, uh, the McCarthy uh, era, because uh, a lot of black leaders had ties to left organizations that were coming under suspicion, and, and certainly that was a, a factor in some other aspects of civil rights. And the other question is simply um, on casualties. In the end, in, in military casualties in Korea, does the black casualty rate um, fit the proportion of the population? And the reason I'm curious about this is, of course, the Vietnam one, which um, there were a lot of protests at the beginning of the Vietnam War that blacks were suffering higher casualties and the military responded by trying desperately not to, to have that out of whack. Uh, yeah, so, so two great questions. Um, there is a, an underlying sense of the McCarthyism and, and the Red Scare and the extent to which that um, could exacerbate their position if they are seen as too overtly anti-war. Uh, as I said, so I, I, I think I said, I just finished writing four chapters about the African-American community in World War I, and it's, that's, that's a lesson that they take from World War I, because I see it again in World War II, and it just carries over. So it isn't, so yes, it's absolutely exacerbated by the Red Scare, but it, it existed earlier, because when World War I begins, um, this, 
to the extent that African Americans are protesting against the war, the, the violence against them and the retribution that is launched uh, is often shrouded in this mask of patriotism, right? And, and so af the African American community learns by 1918, you have to fall all over yourself with patriotic fervor during wartime efforts at, at any moment. Um, there is, there's a, 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 one of the really um, effective organizations for protests in the 1930s in, with regard to uh, uh, integration now, is, and I, I'll, it's a, it's a long name and I forget the name. It's led by A. Philip Randolph and a couple others who are really on the political left. And it's something like the, the League for Nonviolent Opposition to the Segregation of the Military or, or something like that. Uh, and they're very left wing and they're very active in drawing this connection. And then when Korea begins, uh, they go basically go into hi hibernation. And A. Philip Randolph makes a conscious decision that says, in the wake of this growing political outpouring of, you know, yay, rah, rah, America and HUAC and the McCarthyism, we can't be seen as being linked with that effort. So you're absolutely right. There is a, 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 um, a conscious effort to downplay that connection. Um, with regard to casualties, it's a little harder to estimate because the Korean War doesn't uh, keep casualties by race. Um, <laughs> it doesn't distinguish between uh, 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 African-American and, and, and Latin American in particular. Um, although I think that changes towards the end of the war. But we generally say that the casualties uh, are, bet I've seen the number put usually between three and 5,000. Um, mm -hmm. And so that would be about 10% of the war deaths and the African-American community is about 10% of the um, population. So it, it roughly stands, um, but I think uh, that there is a disproportionate number in the early months of the war when they are disproportionately sent to the front lines, and then it slows down later on, which if I remember correctly, is how it is in Vietnam as well. How did the proportion of black servicemen guilty of dereliction of duty compare to the proportion of white servicemen who are guilty of dereliction of duty? It's a great question. Um, and to some extent, I think the numbers could be misleading because white officers are pretty quick to bring up African-American soldiers for alleged dereliction of duty, uh, much more so than they did white soldiers. Oftentimes those cases are simply made up because a lot of the white commanders didn't want to be in charge of African-American units. Um, so to some extent, these charges are exaggerated while they are overlooked in, in the same behavior would be overlooked by white soldiers. So I guess I'm saying there's kind of the official record and the non-official record. Um, officially, African-American soldiers are, are brought up to a much greater degree on charges of dereliction of duty than white soldiers. Again, that starts to even out after the um, integration of the military, of the army in mid 1951. Um, but in that first year in particular, the official narrative has African-American soldiers much more responsible for poor soldiering. And, and a lot of that is simply, an, as I mentioned, uh, an effort by white commanders to reinforce the message that African-Americans were not fit for military service. Um, in reality, I think African-Americans were slightly inferior, not as um, not to the extent that it is claimed by white military leaders, but there was um, probably a slightly greater propensity towards African-American failure on the battlefield than white soldiers. Um, but that's largely a, a reflection of a lack of training uh, lack of preparation and weapons. So for example, the 24th, I was talking about the 24th. So the 24th was stationed in Japan. And since African-American, so, since white commanding officers didn't love the idea of training African-Americans with guns and military discipline, right? A in the after World War II years, they were kept at pretty low numbers. And so when, world, when the Korean War broke out, and of course, as we all know, very suddenly the US is, is unprepared, the American brass says, oh, you know, let's get some African-American soldiers there, ship out the 24th. Well, it turns out the 24th is at like half, maybe two thirds strength. And so they take everybody, cooks, right? Um, supply line chains, secretaries, the people who have no training in military combat whatsoever, they rush them into the 24th and they ship them overseas. So yeah, the 24th and other African-American units at the start of the war probably perform a little worse than white troops, but it's a reflection of the obstacles that were put in their path. Um, once the military is integrated, uh, things really level out. And even in, in fact, in that first year, although the army 
highlights the failures of African-American troops, I could very easily, and I have in, in an article that I've published, um, talk about so, some elements where African-American troops actually distinguish themselves quite well. So I guess I would say overall, the record is pretty similar, maybe slightly worse, but portrayed as significantly worse because of the extra challenges placed in front of them. That was a, that was, that was a really, really great talk, Mitch. Really, really fascinating stuff. Uh, I'm curious, uh, I, I, this might be beyond the purview of your, of your research, but do any of these uh, African-American Korean War veteran go on to become uh, leaders of the civil rights movement? Or, or, I mean, can we follow any of these guys afterwards? And, 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 and does Korea, the experience in Korea, play any role in, in, their, in their activism afterwards, after, after Korea? So that's a great question. Um, I think I would say more, and, I, and I'm going to make a bigger point in a minute. I think I would say, and, this, and I haven't gotten to this section yet in my writing, um, I would say that it is, has more of an impact in turning them into the sort of shock troops rather than the leaders. Uh, they do come back hardened by combat, tougher, a little bit more determined, and a little bit more willing to stick their neck out, um, but less in leadership roles. But the larger point I would make, and I have, have just finished this section, um, that's actually true out of World War II. In fact, it's true out of World War I also. Um, I, think, I think the great generation of civil rights leaders comes really out of World War II. And there are some, some pretty fierce race riots in the aftermath of World War II um, where you see, former, you see veterans playing a really central leadership role. Uh, so I think that, and maybe that's just because of the greater numbers, um, or maybe it's because of the more stark contrast between Nazi Germany and, and the more overt racial hierarchy that that war was fought about. Um, so yes, the Korean War has an impact on hardening the troops, and they do play a more significant role in the post-1953 environment, but I think the bigger step is made in World War II.